is, as you heard when we started, a commitment to self-care. And so we built in these um, short breaks for folks to take a moment, stretch, uh, take some time to look at your phone or answer a couple of calls. But we're really hoping that you will also take these, this, these breaks to just breathe, grab a glass of water, um, take care of yourselves. So we built them in incrementally throughout the day uh, so that you have some time to step away from screen time <laughs> and to step away from Zoom for a second um, before we launch into our, our longer sessions. So this next session, Unapologetically Black, um, our presenter, Umi Hankins, who is senior consultant with Ujima is also a co-founder of the Institute on Domestic Violence in the African American Community. And we say um, mother in the movement because she has served as a mentor to many of us who um, are doing this work right now. Greta and myself um, have been taught much by Umi. She um, really inspired us in the founding of Ujima and has really served um, as one, one as someone who um, from a, a technical assistance approach has really served as grounding. She has led shelters um, and statewide organizations, national organizations in the founding of IDVAC and has been a strong policy voice as it relates to um, the intersection of domestic violence, sexual assault, community violence, and its response in our community, in the black community. So I am so honored to have Umi with us today to share um, her lessons around being unapologetically Black and addressing these issues in the Black community. Thank you again, Karma, for that great introduction. Um, and it has been a long road in doing all of the work. It's been a beautiful long road. Um, one of the things about people saying that I've mentored them is that I that just really to me means that I've had the wonderful opportunity to learn from them because uh, mentoring is a two-way street. That as we give uh, our knowledge, as we share what we know, then that's given back to us on an equal and much greater level. And so um, I think that being exposed and around and able to be with Karma and Greta and many other women in the movement um, to see and understand how things have changed. Uh, things have not stayed static and we've always needed new information to come into the movement. And so I appreciate and thank you for all of that, Karma and Greta. <laughs> so um, unapologetically black, you know, as we talk about that, it's an interesting thing. It happens to be um, a saying that is very prevalent in the black community right now. I really don't know who started it, but it just really took off immediately. It's sort of like when I was growing up in the 60s and Jesse Jackson led us in saying, I'm black and I'm proud, you know, or um, not Jesse, but um, also uh, the singer. Oh, I, got, I can't believe I can't think of his name. Um, James Brown. James Brown. James Brown. Thank you. Blank there. <laughs> James Brown, that's right. I'm black and I'm proud. And it was in that era, that civil rights era, that we were able to say that. And then there was another one where it's, it's, I'm a, it's a black thing, you wouldn't understand. And, um, but we capture that because we're capturing emotions that we have by being who we are and being demeaned, um, being put down, um, being marginalized in so many levels that we have not been able to uh, feel as though the outside world valued who we were. Instead, they disrespected who we were. And so we in our Black community practice our resiliency in coming up with these types of sayings and then meaning them and understanding what it means. It's like I've never had to really explain to too many Black people what it means when I say I am unapologetically Black. They understand right away because it's this life lesson that we all have had and that to say it is to feel it and to embrace it. And so it is something that we say and embrace right now. I am unapologetically Black. But as we talk about being unapologetically Black, then um, we also recognize that race 
is something that we've had conversations about for a long time. And historically, they have positioned race to be a dividing factor, that it was based on these physical characteristics that um, they tried to say made black people different than white people. That if they could find something that was different within this black race, that they could attribute to our not being valuable, to our being less than, then they could, they, society, could take this in a white supremacist undertone and make it where black people then would then also feel as though they're less than because I have these characteristics. So not only would the broader society see us as less, but it could also make us see us as less. And so things like devaluing our physical characteristics, as I show you all this hair on my head, all these long locks, to devalue our physical characteristics or the size of our nose or the way that our mouth is made, um, to go throughout history and, and try to devalue that in any way that's possible, then would say, see, I told you that they're not worthy, that they don't deserve the same thing that white mainstream supremacists uh, um, deserve. But, you know, there have been a lot of things that have been done in science and um, geneticists and biologists don't agree with this issue that there is something that's different between black and white people. Because in reality, we know that 85 to 90% of the differences that we have between these races, that it's very small. You know, 85 to 95 percent of everything is the same that we share. And if you went all around the world, it wouldn't matter. 85 to 95 percent of what possesses me as a person would also be the same for others as well. And so we actually all share a common ancestor and uh, Africa, because if we go back to the time when the bones of the first person was, the first female woman was found, then we would see that they have identified that woman in Africa as being black. But yet we take it and say that no, these characteristics, these minor characteristics, the style of my hair somehow impacts my brain power, impacts my intellect or intel uh, impacts some way um, in which makes me intelligent, makes me kind, makes me generous, that somehow the color of my skin makes it where I am not worthy of having the fullness, the richness of life that can be shared. And so we see these physical differences and somehow we can account for them that way, but really the only way that we can account for them is by the fact that black people lived among black people and therefore they populated together. Or if they migrated, then as uh, Karma was talking about earlier, the differences in, our, um, in, in who is black would be defined that way because if someone came from Africa, whether in the real early days before the 15th century on their own, but if someone came through slavery, they were still inside of a population of other people in different spaces, and therefore families would be raised out of that. Children would be born out of those connections. And so that accounts for this wide diversity, this variation that we have between um, the different, what we call races that exist. Um, there was also war, a lot of rape that went on in warfare. Um, rape being used as a tool actually of war. And then a lot of intermarriages then that have accounted for this. I'm doing a lot of work on my ancestors and uh, I participate in one of those um, sites and I'm able to go back to the 1870s and 1880s and see the population in the census as who was there. And I find it very interesting because what happens is that one, before 1870, you don't see any black people in the census because we were not counted. We were considered um, to be property and therefore we were kept in different roles, not in the role of um, the census for other humans. And, um, but as I look at the census starting into, in 1870s, 
70, then you also start to see that white people and black people are living together really, because as slavery ended and as the enslavement of black people ended, then they were still in the community together. And so consequently, you would still have um, them living in, in a very close proximity and having children together. Uh, so you would see mulatto children in the 70s and the 80s. They had a hard time trying to account for their skin tone. So they would say, okay, this is black. This person's black because they're a darker skin tone. This person's white because they don't have any mixed blood. And then this person is mulatto because they have been um, perhaps had one white parent and one black parent. And consequently, um, the white women could not raise those children <laughs> that were mulatto. So many times those children were given away. So we have a lot of different ways that we can account for the differences in our skin tone, um, the differences in our eye color, uh, my father actually had, um, when he was a young man, had green eyes, vividly green eyes. As an older man, my father had um, hazel eyes, and he was black, um, part white uh, in his lineage someplace, as was obvious. But clearly, we can still look and say that there are reasons that that exists, but it doesn't make these races different. Doesn't mean that the black race is now different than the white race as we use this term race at all. And so um, the defining blackness, that became a real issue in our census because if we're looking at our census and saying, okay, well, who is black? Who's going to be put into this category of being called black? And the census uh, identifies a black as uh, a person having origins in any of the black uh, racial groups in, Af in Africa, sub-Saharan, racial groups in Africa. And you'll note that it says the sub-Saharan groups in, in Africa, because as you go further north, then you had more people of fairer complexion. And so they're not counting people who may be of a fairer complexion that are north of the Saharan desert in Africa, but still really focusing on who is Black by defining this this uh, term related to a geographical area. And so if we look at the Sub-Saharan, you can see everything that is below that white space, then it's called the Sub-Saharan uh, part of Africa. And everything above that then being Northern Africa, being classified as something different. And we do have um, people, academicians, that are really concerned about this because they look at it and say, um, and to call the, the Sahara Desert, Sub-Saharan still is another way that you're demeaning who the people are that are below the northern aspect of Africa and having some reference to how you feel about them um, as individuals that are living in that area. Somehow there this this um, discourse gets connected to the fact that you're below the Saharan, you're so therefore you are still less than. So, but there have been many ways that we uh, over history have defined our blackness to classify who we are. Um, and when I say we, I don't just mean mean, I'm, for the most part, I mean society has chosen that white supremacists, people who are clear that there is a difference in, in their estimation between white people and black people, then they have defined this in many different ways. One is that one drop rule. So you can have um, you know, a lineage where you have one person who is in your family out of 32 who is black and then the other 32 then become um, the other 31 people, that doesn't matter, that doesn't matter. If you had that one drop of black blood, then you're black and you were less than, and you were classified as that, and you were inducted into an enslavement process. Or they called it Negro blood, black blood, one black ancestor, traceable amount rule, or a hyper descent rule. So those were some of the ways. And then, you know, we went on to hear that we call that, call black people as Negro, which was a Spanish way of looking at it, Spanish word meaning black, mulatto, which I talked about a little earlier. You hear that a lot um, in the South, but you also heard it a lot in Louisiana 
as uh, our Creole uh, in Louisiana, as the French then were in Louisiana and the mixture of blood took place there. Or we were colored people. And um, we accepted that. Black people today, as we call ourselves Black, accepted some of these terms, mulatto, Negro, colored. In fact, in my history, I can say that I've identified as Negro and colored, as well as Black, depending on what point in history we have looked at and what was considered to be proper. And to be very upset if someone called you something different. Um, you know, I'm not Black, I'm colored. It was the indoctrination that took place of us as Black people to ensure that this Blackness meant bad. It was the indoctrination that went on with even the color Black, if it were in the movie. The good guys were the white hats, the bad guys were the, the Black hats. It was a continuation of something that was perpetuated, but it was a political social way into to ensuring that Black people felt that they were less than and that white people were more deserving. Um, there is also the you know, African Black that was referred to when someone is very, very dark com complected. Um, I share a, um, um, one of the um, websites that I look at, it's constantly posting up beautiful, dark, dark skinned Black women and, and just admiring how beautiful they are. And I'm trying to get society to move beyond this whole issue of what's pretty. And um, because it's seen that the lighter complected you are, the prettier you were. The closer to whiteness you had, the prettier you were or you are. And therefore trying to take us back and say, no, black is beautiful. I'm black and I'm proud, you know, to those days and to ensure that we are clear that um, we're using, we're not being prejudiced. We're not demeaning uh, anyone for the coloration of the skin. All people are human. <laughs> there is one race and that is the human race. Passing for white, um, it happened many times in the black community. And sometimes it was actually accepted in the black community because it was a means of getting out of the subjugation that you were living in. And so your black mother may have encouraged you to pass for white to live in a white community, because then you would get out of being part of that, um, that um, discrimination. You would become part of the more elite. You would be more acceptable. And so giving up your family, which had to be very, very traumatic, this family that loved you, but giving up your family and then going out and saying that, um, no, I'm white and just, pretend, just living a life in a white community and not in giving any recognition to your heritage of blackness that raised you. Very common in sometimes as well. Um, and you know, and sometimes it was a bad thing. Sometimes people were uh, passing for white. It wasn't what their family wanted them to do, but they wanted to get from under the, what is it, the, the foot of the oppressor. They wanted to leave the foot of the oppressor and therefore they did it to save themselves but it may not have helped their family, their community, but they needed to help themselves. They needed to save themselves. People of color, we hear that still today, and then African descent or African di diaspora being part of those as well. So there have been many, many different ways that Blackness has been defined, but more to the fact that um, it's how you define yourself a lot of that is just how do you define, do you define yourself as black or not? Uh, some people have color to their skin. They may, they may be fair complected, but not identify as being black. And I know that this meeting is uh, taking place in, in the Western region and that all of these states are there. And so what I encourage you to do is to look at your demographics within your state because some of these states may have a lot of black people that are recognized there, or in certain pockets, they may have a lot of black people. And some of your states may have just few black people, but does that mean that you don't acknowledge the black race? No, that doesn't mean that. Just because you may not have 70, 80%, I live in Detroit, okay? So the vast majority, almost 90%, if not a little over 90% now, 
of people who live in Detroit, um, Michigan are black. But it doesn't have to be that way. We need to make sure that we are constantly uplifting blackness wherever so that it becomes the mainstream. It becomes acceptable that we all look at black people and understand their richness, their beauty, even though it may be different than white people, it must be different than white people because there's beauty in who we are and start to accept that and make that a worldwide initiative as well. So when we say that, um, you know, race is not real, what do we mean by that? Well, it, if we look at what it says in the literature, it says that race is a social construct. It's a made up belief. It's something that was made up, that was developed for the purpose of oppressing a group of people. Not true. There is no such thing as race as we talk about the black race. There is no such thing as, excuse me, the white race um, as we talk about that doesn't exist. There is the human race. The only thing that there is is the human race. But this was a construct that was necessary in order for white supremacy to justify the treatment of black people. If you thought that that little black girl out in the field picking flowers was, um, was valuable, if you thought she deserved to be loved, then you wouldn't rape her. <laughs> You wouldn't send beat her. You wouldn't uh, do the harsh things that were done to this body of people over the many centuries um, in, in enslavement, whether that was enslavement in the U.S. or enslavement worldwide. Enslavement didn't just happen in the U.S., it happened worldwide. But it was used to justify your, the, their birthplace, the color of their skin was used to justify that you were less than and more than that, it was used to justify the white race ability to come in and colonize different areas across the world, to take land from people. It was used to justify land ownership and wealth for white people and not for black people. So if we can create enough scenarios, enough discourse positioning that white people are better, more intelligent, deserve to have more money, deserve to be, to be richer, then we can create laws and policies that take us to that point. That as we frame our policies, then we won't be looking at how do we provide for this marginalized group, but how can we put more on their backs to ensure that their workload, that um, their place in society will harm them and bring more than to the white community. So it's been very um, visible in our faces. This hasn't been something that has just happened in the last um, 50 years. This has been centuries long in the making, and now it's woven into the fabric of our society. It's woven into how we think and who we leave out and who we don't care about and who deserves to live and who deserves health care who doesn't deserve health care? Who deserves safe housing? Who doesn't deserve safe housing? Who deserves food and or who deserves to live in a food desert? These things are woven into the decisions that are made, the legislation that is passed in order for us to ensure the wealth, the well-being of whiteness and to be able to have white supremacy as the bottom line of what it is we believe we should be doing and valuing. So it's not a, a, a biological or scientific construct. Um, it's just a social construct. As easily as it was made up, we must then go towards trying to figure out how to break that down. And breaking that down requires some of what we see in our streets today. And so as we see the protests and the marches, um, that, that are so visible in our community. It is because we need to wake up. We need to be woke. We need to understand that the stereotypes that have perpetuated the existence of what we see in systems against Black people, the way that Black people are treated 
in systems, and I don't mean just police, but if we look at police, if we look at child welfare, if we look at all of the systems, the financial system, the housing system, if we look at all the systems, Black people are disproportionately represented um, and marginalized in those systems. But we talk about color, and we also have to realize that it's not just about color, because um, ethnicity has been combined with race or colorism in order to make it not a good thing for you to be valued at all. So it's not just about who, what your color is, but where you're from. What, you know, how do you define yourself? What is your culture? What, where, what region, what geographical region do you live in? And who are your ancestors? What was your language? Because in the midst, particularly as we talk about in the United States of America, well, if you don't speak English, then you're considered to be not intelligent. If you, regardless of what region you come from, um, you know, it's interesting because I've met, I've traveled around the world. And as I meet people, I'm always amazed at the number of languages um, that they speak. Um, I met an African woman um, when I was actually in Brazil, and she spoke like six languages. I felt really like something's wrong. Where did I miss out? So the value of speaking languages and your even uh, ability and value in the, the, the market, the financial market, is just unbelievably more uh, just from being able to do that. But yet... We still look at it and say, in the United States, there is this discourse that says, speak English, what's wrong with you? Um, and so we need to make sure that we're addressing the issue of culture and ethnicity because um, Ujima has, is serving, recognizing that we are not just serving African-Americans, people who have been, um, whose ancestors have been in this enslavement process in our history, but we are serving more than African Americans. We are serving, um, in addition to people of the Latinx community um, who may or may not have been born here. We are serving people who may or may not have been born in Africa, but their family members, their ancestors are our direct descendants um, from Africa and have immigrated um, to the United States. And we have to value that we are looking at the African Caribbean people and understanding that, you know, they may in some areas speak English. Yes, that's a great thing. Or they may speak Spanish or other languages. That's a great thing too. But the richness that we're looking for is that within that diversity of their geographical location comes the diversity of their culture. And their culture may be different than the African American culture. In fact, as Ujima has done a series of listening sessions, we find many ways in which our cultures overlap. And there, there are things that we believe in that are the same. Uh, and then there are things that aren't the same. And so as we're providing services, as we're looking at constructing um, ways to provide culturally appropriate and enriched services to, to victims of and survivors of domestic and sexual violence. As we're doing that, we have to recognize the diversity that's within the Black community. It's not just African Americans. It's much more than that. And their ethnicity, their um, values, their cultural beliefs may be different depending on how they were raised. And we should look at that and value that, value their traditions as well. So, you know, um, Karma mentioned this. She said the African American community, the African immigrant or refugee community, the African Caribbean or Latino community, and those who identify as Black or who others may identify as Black. Because the reality of it is, our Blackness comes from the fact of where the ship dropped us off. <laughs> it's just a matter of where the slave ship stopped for the most part. There were other Africans that. Um, migrated out, yes, in a very long time ago and even came to America before Columbus did. However, for the most part, Africans throughout the world were distributed 
where slaves were needed. And therefore it was where the ship dropped them off. And we talk about race and then we talked about uh, ethnicity, but that's not the only way in which we have identity. Um, identity comes on many different levels. Um, we mentioned a little bit about language, but class as well, because this marginalization of people didn't originally start off with race. It started off with class and it didn't matter what skin tone you were, but it was with class that poor people didn't deserve to have anything. And, and the work of the world was to be put on poor people and the, the disenfranchisement that was being perpetuated was to be put on poor people so that wealthy people who were majority white people, wealthy people could have more money, could have more status, could have more land. And so class over time was combined with race as black people were marginalized and enslaved, then class and race were put together. And so that's why we see in so many instances, the fact that we see what we call ghettos in our neighborhood where black people live and have been segregated to live because they didn't deserve to live in the suburbs. They only deserve to have a little, they needed to be all clustered together and, um, and live together and not to be able to uh, integrate within the schools or other society. So education became an issue as well um, in how we identify ourselves, our gender, our sexuality, our age, as I confess that, um, you know, I'm older um, or uh, I think Adrian, what did, I'm not sure what Adrian said, it's wiser or whatever, but I'm moving into that realm as well as being you know, gaining more knowledge, you know, that I've been around longer and I've read a lot and, and experienced a lot of things. And so I'm trying to bring that knowledge to me. But many times that age is not valued. You're seen as being in the way, as disposable. Um, we look at all the people who have been hospitalized with COVID and how easy it was to initially just go to people, particularly Black people, and just say, listen, 70 years old, 75 years old, you lived a good life, you know, so, you know, do you really want to be resuscitated? Do you really want to go through that at this point? You've lived a good life. And turning machines off and stop trying to save people who may still be able to uh, come out of that horrible disease. But the same thing is just perpetuated all over in our healthcare that older people may not be valued, they've lived their life, they need to give up, they need to turn over their wealth or whatever it is that they have and let the younger generation to come. So the younger generation being more valued, not children, no, not children, but more that middle class, um, middle age person, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s. Once you get over 40, then you know, what value do you really have? You, you don't have a lot of time left in the workforce. And so our value gets placed on who we are and how much money we can earn, as opposed to particularly in many black communities, that's not how we see our seniors. That's not how we value them. It's not about how much you earn. It's not about where you work. It's about your bringing the wisdom, bringing the knowledge from from all the time that you've spent into our black community. So all of these things are different ways in which people can identify and may suffer from a combination of oppressions. And so just because a person is um, black and, and middle class, yes, they may be black, and but have resources that they can buy property. Maybe not every place they wanna buy property, but they may be able to buy property and have more status or immigration status or religious status as we see so much um, happening in our world today. And all of those things then can move into that category of oppression. So if it's race that you're being marginalized around, then it's racism that we're talking about or sexism or homophobia. All of these things can move into this area that you can be oppressed 
because you identify as disabled. Um, therefore, again, what's your earning level? What value do you have in society? What education do you have? No, you're just gonna work at McDonald's. You're just gonna have a $7 an hour job. So you have no education, you have no value in our society. And so as we're making these changes, as we're talking about um, equity, then we're not just talking about equity around race, but we're talking about equity around the intersectionality of all of these things within the race. And so that we will make sure that we're honoring everyone's life experience. Um, one of my friends and I in Karma at one time, we, um, this is some years ago, but we would talk to black people and just try to get some understanding of how they saw what their perceptions of blackness was, just to have those conversations and see. And, you know, what did it mean to be black? And um, we came up with um, a very interesting list of ways in which different Black people saw the Black experience. Um, it was having language be beyond standard English. And so um, having that Black dialect that we can break into at will and talk, whether it's, uh, as some people say, the King's English or Standard English or Black English. I don't go for Ebonics too much, never got into that term, but um, Black English. And so, but if you're talking Black English, you would not be valued. You would not be trusted um, because you're seen as less intelligent. Has nothing to do with intelligence because we can measure intelligence on many different factors. Has nothing to do with intelligence but it has to do with the way in which you learn language. Uh, resilient, a lot of people um, said that, that they thought that black people were resilient. Other, because if we weren't, we wouldn't be around. History has done that to us in that way. That we had spirituality, that we connected to the universe, that we connect to uh, our belief systems, that we pass down information through oral traditions. And so whereas, no, a lot of Black people may not read um, books uh, as much, but we have an oral tradition, and that's not to say we don't read, please, but we have a way of passing down our family information in an oral tradition. So sitting around the kitchen table becomes a very valuable time, particularly as holidays, and we sit and we have our families there, and we have all that food, and we're telling stories, and we're sharing past uh, histories about our families and our forefathers becomes very enriching and healing for us. Um, our food being a part of that. Um, while we say that Black people eat soul food, we do recognize that it's Southern cooking because of the enslavement of people in the South and that those were the foods that they ate in the South. I learned that lesson when I moved to Florida. I just thought it was soul food. And then I went to Florida and was able to buy Frank's hot sauce at any grocery store that I went to, along with grits. So I learned that story, that, that fact when I moved to Florida. So it's Southern cooking, yes, but Black people have taken on this tradition and still continue to pass it through generation after generation. Do we eat other foods? Absolutely, we do. And we should, um, we should. Um, because a lot of the food that was comes out of the Southern tradition uh, is fried or a um, um, lot of meat. And knowing that if we're taking care of our bodies, if we want to be healthy, we should look at how do we diversify our foods. Music and art, um, they thought a lot of Blackness is enculturated into that, that we're very diverse. We're animated and expressive. Here I am on Zoom and I can't, I'm trying to keep my hands down in my lap and it's really hard, you know, because I'm just talking with my hands. We're very animated and we love it. We love it. Our voices go up. It's great, you know, we're exciting. Um, people come to us. They, they want to be around us because we have so much incite, excitement when we talk and when we do things and when we sing or when we dance and then, you know, they, they want to admire that. But at the same time, they want to demean us for being who we are. But we also heard things like um, that Black people are carrying the burden of trauma um, because over our entire history, there's been so much trauma. 
and that trauma gets passed on from generation to generation. Physically gets passed on from generation and to generation through our DNA and our cells. And as we become more traumatized, in, as our children become more traumatized, then that trauma can break out and then just explode in their lives as well. That we're wallowing in pain, that we're carrying so much pain and yet there has been nothing that has been done to help us to transition from this burden of trauma to wallowing in this pain to be able to get to well-being and wellness through our mental health system, through our um, way in which we engage Black people. That we're expressive. Um, we sometimes, we, it's said that we have rage. I always like to say we have justifiable rage. Who wouldn't be angry <laughs> at what we've been through? So there is justifiable rage that, is, that Black people may possess. At the same time, we know that we're looking at how do we um, deal with this rage so that it does not become harmful to our lives. We're feared the way in which we're talked about for black men particularly. We code switch. We have a way of talking that may send messages that really isn't saying what, what people think we are saying. So we take our language. We're very creative with our language and our dialogue and how we express things and we code switch. And sometimes we, in the same sentence, we can be, have black English, and then we can turn around and have standard English. Now, that's not a problem when they talk about Spanish, when that's done all the time in Spanish. But for black people, we're considered less intelligent when we code switch like that. And we're part of the African diaspora. And there were a few other things that we're Southern. We're carrying a history of enslavement. We're attached by policies on war on drugs, that we're positioned for incarceration. That we're not just incarcerated, that we're positioned for incarceration from child, um, from child welfare to juvenile justice to jail to incarceration. We are positioned for incarceration through systems that are disproportionately um, represented and have a lot of racial bias against Black people. Racism, I, I want to call it what it is, have a lot of racism uh, against Black people. Um, the culture uh, dedi um, dedicated by, dictated by system, that our culture is sometimes dictated by systems, how we're expected to act and behave, that systems are trying to make us say that, or that we're authentically black, meaning that I'm acting black, I'm looking black, and you know maybe I am not, I am just um, wearing, my style is all over me, that you see I'm authentically black, that we're poor and struggling because of the way that systems have um, positioned us. We're uneducated, that history of incarceration, oppressed by economics, and attached to systems. So all of these things, basically black people were able to identify with some of them good and some of them horrible. Some of them horrible that they're not saying, I identify with it, I, I, I know that we're perceived this way, I don't agree with it, but I know that this is how I am living. I am living in this world that sees me this way. And therefore I have to consci consciously be vigilant on how I'm presenting myself to save my own life, to save my life, okay? So, um, and then we're weaving in and out of life experiences. So as we talked about all of those ways that we self-identify, some of those things are ways that we have privilege and some of those things are ways that we're marginalized. So if we are a white man, upper or middle class, Christian and heterosexual, then we have privilege. If we fall into that category, we have privilege. But if we're a black woman, lower class, non-Christian, homosexual or bisexual or queer or transgender, then we are marginalized. That society has positioned us to be marginalized because we don't fall within that class of privilege. And we went in and out of these experiences. So I'm a black woman, but Praise God, I'm middle class. At least they tell me I am. I'm middle class, meaning that I'm supposed to have some resources, and I do. I own a house. Or rather, I own a mortgage. That's what I own. 
I own a mortgage and, you know, I have a car, I have a sports car. Um, you know, I'm able to buy groceries. I wasn't worried about food when COVID hit. I could go out there and buy as much food as my refrigerator could hold. And it had never had that much food in it before because I didn't need it. And I was traveling all the time and it was just too much food. So now I'm just trying to get rid of it. So I'm privileged in that way. I'm a Christian black woman. So I'm privileged in that way. I'm seeing, I, you know, I can have my holidays. I can talk about our Lord Jesus Christ and feel as though I'm not going to be scolded or uh, somehow seen as being um, um, inappropriate in, in an environment. So I have privilege in those ways. And when I have privilege, it's my responsibility in those areas to make sure that I'm uplifting others that don't have that same privilege. So when I'm at a meeting and I'm participating in a meeting and I look around the table and I say, Who's, who was invited to that table? And if I don't see my lesbian sister and that I identify as heterosexual, if I don't see my lesbian sister at that table, then I need to speak up and talk about the issues. I need to be the one that speaks up and talks about the issues for the black LGBTQ community. And I need to figure out how we ensure that we're getting in individuals invited to the table, that our table is bigger, that our table grows so that they directly can share um, in how we're developing our, not only our practices, our policies, how we're conducting research. People need to be at the table in order for them to participate. Um, we're also marginalized, even in the Black community, for the darker skin, um, homeless individuals, or being, as I said, LGBTQ or, or uh, non-Christian. And if we have a history of incarceration, then we're looked at, even in the Black community, as being different or less than, or the sexualization of women and girls, sexualization of women and girls, that as young as, I think I read an article not, not long ago, I think it was like six, seven year old little girls are being sexualized, black girls are being sexualized, losing their childhood as they're being sexualized in a way to fit a stereotype on who black women and girls are and what they do. Um, but sometimes within our uh, community, in our black community, we also suffer from internalized oppression issues so that we look at other people in our community um, and say that if they're educated, oh, they're just trying to be white. You know, if they're um, being elitist or have risen to a social level, uh, attending a ball or going to certain dances or being able to do certain things in their community, um, having some political status, then we say, oh, they're just an elite because we're trying to say that they're not authentically black. Um, or if they're talking standard English, may be demeaned by that. Or having proper eating habits, knowing, you know, um, not eating with your hands, which is good. And I even go to the Ethiopian restaurant and enjoy it very much. So eating with our hands is not a bad thing, but it is marginalized or light-skinned um, people who are seen as being, thinking they're better than dark-skinned people. Or this term, Miss Anne, maybe you haven't heard of that. That's an older term, Miss Anne, where we, um, people on the plantation, used to refer to the slave owner's wife as being Miss Anne. And so even in our community, someone may say to you, who do you think you are, Miss Anne? You know, as if you're trying to be that master's wife, that, that woman who is more than uh, you think you are. Um, and that has been used. You may not have heard of that one for the younger generation. In my generation, that was quite common. I've been called that. <laughs> and so anyway, the impact of oppression of um, Black women. And so when we look at what's happened, because of our Blackness, because of our, um, the way in which um, we are perceived because of the way in which systems write laws, write practice and procedures, then we are overrepresented in all of these areas. Because 
how we're treated is different than how a white person in the same position is treated. So we are disproportionately represented in all of these areas. Poverty, homelessness, home foreclosures, which happened 10 years ago, 12 years ago, um, 13 years ago. Who suffered? It was very clear. Black people were losing their homes. Attention was not paid to it until white people were also losing their homes. When it was discovered that white people were losing their homes, it became a crisis and it had to be taken care of. Substance abuse. When black people are on substance, it's illegal. It's treated as a crime and you're incarcerated. When it became common for white, particularly rural mothers in, the, in, um, uh, in various cities and areas, to use substances and to abuse those substances, then it's a disease. It's a health issue and it's treated differently. You are not incarcerated, you're given services. Again, this pathway of how Black people are taken through society, through our society, to ensure that we will not succeed and that we're headed toward this system of incarceration, which has become this really money-making system on the blacks of, of backs of black people that um, the physical and mental illness disproportionately represented there quite frankly um if you had all the trauma it's amazing that we're not all certifiably having mental dis disorders it's amazing uh, this is why i have to absolutely practice meditation if I did not practice meditation, if I did not practice all my coping skills, then I might be certifiably, certifiable with mental health disorders because it is so much. Um, today I had to, before I joined you, I had to meditate three times because I saw something on, on Twitter about a black man in Walmart being arrested for buying a bike. <laughs> and, and, I saw it there and I just immediately, I was like, oh wait, I gotta calm down. I gotta practice my coping. This is not right. And I can do some other things about that, but right now I gotta practice my coping skill or we would all have mental health challenges. Um, no permanent housing, no low income housing, put into a position where we have less than financially and then can't afford a place to live. Arrest and incarceration, we talked about those things juvenile justice system, child welfare system, amazing how Native American and Black children and families were driven to the child welfare systems and disproportionately taken away from their families. I did a project a long time ago, maybe 20, um, 15, 20, 15 years ago, I think it was, in looking at the disproportionate rate of, of um, Black children and Native American children in the child welfare system. And that was traumatizing. To witness it was traumatizing. To hear the stories of how they got there and to be in a position where I'm comparing a black family to a white family who are both in the child welfare system and how the white family gets treatment, gets resources and services and the black family have their children taken away. Very much, um, happening through our systems. So as we talk about and hear these things about defund, reform, um, abolish the police, what it's really saying is all of our systems have to be reviewed and looked at. We have to make sure that we are clear on what's happening in our systems towards Black people. And once we become clear, we have to develop practices we have to develop strategies. We have to develop laws and regulations that changes the way in which systems are put there in order to ensure the continuation of oppression of the Black community. And, um, you know, when, when we're looked at, we say, well, what is it about Black people that gets so devalued? Um, well, it's because people fear us. Uh, I think they also fear that there will be some type of retaliation for what has happened in our history. That might be one. Um, they fear our culture. They, they fear because it's different than theirs. 
It's not the same. They fear us because we act and look different. Um, they fear our families. They devalue our food. Um, you know, uh, it, you know, it's interesting with the devaluing the food. I shop a lot at places like Whole Foods or other health food stores just because of the way that I eat. Collard greens, turnip greens, stacked up high in these places because they're superfoods. They are superfoods. And so while they're talking about Black people eating collard greens or uh, eating watermelon, these are superfoods that now we are finding that everybody who is conscious of their health is trying to eat. Um, they devalue our, our beauty, our physical characteristics, our personalities, our clothes, our language and dialect. They, uh, our voice tone, um, the quality of our voice and the tone of our voice, uh, music and art, all of these things, to basically just who we are as a people is framed as being negative, as being um, tacky, um, not valued, unappreciated, um, you know, just seeing just the whole way in which we're characterized as being in, that care, being in that category. So now you see why we started off this presentation with I am, and we're changing that recognition of who I am. I'm not those things that they have looked at me and seen and identified me as being, and neither are you. I am powerful. I am blessed. I am the epitome of intelligence. I am creative. That's why we go those things because we have to retrain ourselves. We have to drop and shed all of this negativity that's been riding on our backs for so long. We have to knock off that negativity and we have to embrace who we really are. And we have to bring it into reality so that we can continue to grow our families. So our children, when we're carrying our children in our wombs, we're not giving them the genes of despair, the genes of trauma, but we're sharing with them a spirituality, a happiness, a, a, a way of seeing the wor world in an optimistic way so that they can embrace the goodness and they will still, from past generations, be able to recognize their Stomachs will turn when they're being oppressed because that's the genetic way it works. They will look and say, hmm, something doesn't feel right. I'm not sure what it is, but something doesn't feel right because I'm having this emotional reaction. My body is taking on this emotion and something is wrong with what somebody said to me that was negative. And we have to learn then that we're going to stop and we're going to listen and we're going to process that and say, what was it about what that person said to me? Is it true? No. Is it reality? No. And then we go into our meditative form that I am great. I am powerful. And we go into understanding who we really are. So Sankofa is uh, a Twi word in Africa, meaning understanding the impact of the historical context of violence against Black women on the disparities and disproportionality of the uh, society's ill that they experience today. Now, what it literally just means is reaching back and bringing forward. And so the so Sankofa image was developed to show this bird reaching back, turning its head, reaching back on its back and picking up the egg and then bringing it forth. We have to understand what it means to be black. We have to understand white supremacy. We have to understand the history of how those things came together and what has been experienced by us and how we are seen in these social ills over time because of the way in which this discourse this marginalization, this, um, this disenfranchisement and discrimination and bias and stereotyping. We have to know that those tools of oppression that were used to position us to be where we are. We have to reach back, understand what happens, 
and then bring forth a different reality that we can live in. If you're not attacking and dismantling the false stereotypes about people, you are complicit. I, you know, I think that's clearer to me now than it has ever been. Silence is not an option. <laughs> you cannot be silent. If you're silent, you're complicit. Either you're speaking out, you're marching, you're raising your hand, you're writing a book, you're addressing it in some way. Either you are attacking and dismantling those false stereotypes about the Black community, or you have to understand you're complicit with what exists in our, in our lives today, in society today. Society is what it is because of complicity, because people, the majority, the silent majority is being complicit with white supremacy. So we have just a couple of facts. Um, according to the CDC, black women ages 25 to 29 are 11 times more likely as white women in that age group to be murdered while pregnant in the first year after childbirth. Is this because we're just, you know, more violent? We are positioned for this violence in the black community. You can't carry this level of trauma in your bodies and your minds and not have some positioning for this. Does that mean we excuse it? Absolutely not. We do not excuse it. And we must be conscious about ensuring that we are working to stop violence against Black women. And at the same time, we must recognize that our community needs to be healed, needs to be, um, have resources, needs to be in a position that we can figure out how did it come about that this is happening in our community? How does this come about? And it's not just because of black men. It has to do with sexism. It has to do with racism. It has to do with internalized oppression, all of these things. And we have to figure out how to heal our community in order to stop this from continuing in our community. Our black babies cannot be without their mothers. Firearms were used in about 54% of all female homicides compared to all other racial groups. Black women are most commonly killed by firearms. As we talk about gun control, as we look at the necessity of it, as we look at having guns taken out of a home where there is domestic violence, those laws are being put into place to protect women and children. Mm -hmm and families in our community, as well as everyone in our community. But if we don't find a way in order to ensure that we're recognizing that most Black women are killed by firearms, that they're shot by firearms. And, you know, if we're not doing something about this in our homes, in our community, in our trainings, in our policies, if we're not working to do something about this, to make it where guns are not as common in our communities, then this will continue to happen. Among students, 11% of black girls in the nation's high school sample, in a nation's high school sample, reported having been raped. High school girls, 11%. This is in our community, but again, what are we doing? How are we teaching our girls? How are we teaching our boys? How are we changing the trauma in society, that society is waging on our community such that violence is an outlet, seen as someone trying to have something out of nothing? How are we changing what's happening in our own communities as well? Thank you, Ujima, for doing your work. For every Black woman who reports rape, at least 15 Black women do not report. So just because we hear these stats on how many Black women are raped, know that those stats are much higher than what we are seeing that's being documented. And why are Black girls silent? 
because of those same reasons. One, they're going to blame that black girl. They're going to blame her for being raped because she's been sexualized. It was what she had on. It was the way she walked. It was the flippant way she threw her hair. She encouraged him to rape her is the discourse that is coming up. And so, yes, within, within the issue of racism, there's also sexism. And so rape is a tool of sexism, whether it's a black man or a white man. And as we have seen black men and, and black women, you know, in, during times of enslavement, during times of the 40s and the 50s, we're really trying to protect black women. But the trauma that is living in our community must be addressed in order for us to give um, more support to stopping these rapes. African Americans who make up 40% of the homeless population, despite only representing 13, make up and despite only representing 13% of the general population. So 40% of our homeless population is African American. 40%, or I should say black, because again, they're black, they're African American, they're African, they are African Caribbean. So that is very diverse, but a large part of it, yes, is African American. And so how do we change all of those dynamics that's making it where we don't have the financial resources, um, we don't have accessibility to reasonably priced housing, um, the eviction rate, what happens with COVID when um, now that the eviction moratorium is stopped, Who's going to be disproportionately evicted from their homes? We need not even guess. We know who it is. So I say that we are unapologetically Black because there are so many wonderful things about us as a Black population. There are so many beautiful things that we bring to the world, to society, to, the, to our communities, to the world, and we love that. We love the way in which we express ourselves and all of the value that we bring to our communities and society. So yes, we're unapologetically Black at the same time that we recognize that Blackness is not a real thing, that race is not a real thing. Racism is real, race is not. Racism is real and race is not. And so as we recognize those things, we can be proud of who we are. And we would not understand how this disparity exists within our community and the way in which um, we're disproportionately marginalized and represented in, in systems. We would not understand that if we were not collecting data that shows us how this happens. If we stop collecting data, then it'll just be like, ah, there's 40%, there's 50% of these people who are homeless and they just, you know, fall into different ways than which they identify. But we wouldn't understand that 40% of those people who are homeless are black people. We wouldn't understand that and we're only 13% of the population. We wouldn't see how that is happening in our communities. And so we want to be able to identify that. We want racism to stop. That's what we want to stop. Just like survivors of domestic and sexual violence, they want the violence to stop. They want the rape to stop. That's what they want stopped. We want to stop the racism that's experienced within the multitude of people that identify as Black throughout the diversity of how we exist. So, that's the presentation. And now I, I want to ask you to think, how has racism shown up in your local communities? What is happening in your local communities that you see how racism is showing up and causing survivors of domestic and sexual violence to be um, not to be safe, not to be able to experience well-being? Please share with us.
So Umi, um, you know, certainly I'm with Ujima and we also talked about um, the fact that Ujima is within the um, DC Coalition Against Domestic Violence. So much of our work um, on a local perspective is um, through in Washington, DC, yeah. where we've seen um, in the past couple of years, how gentrification has changed the makeup of the city. And so <clears throat> while in the 80s and 90s, Washington DC was at times almost 90% um, black and that being African-American, Afro-Latinx, um, African immigrant, et cetera. Now the numbers have shifted and we are right at about 50% of the population. And I think at the last, actual last um, count, we were right at about 49%. And so <clears throat> while we have seen that um, change in the population makeup, as it relates to systems, whether it's through law enforcement, the child welfare system, the juvenile justice system, we haven't seen a shift. So you're still seeing numbers where 70 to 80 to 90% in the juvenile justice system, 99.8% of those juveniles who um, are incarcerated within the system are black. And so what that says to us is that, um, you know, racism, as it is, has impacted our interactions with systems such that, you know, before part of the reasoning for why we were engaged in systems was because we were overwhelmingly represented in the population. But that can't be true as the population has shifted, but those numbers has not changed. And so we know that there is a systemic reason and what you said earlier, Umi, around the positioning um, of Black people in our communities as it relates to how we then um, are, are seen in systems is very real. And from a DC perspective, that's what we've seen. And, and as we've been having conversations as Ujima across the country in various communities, we've seen that as well. Thank you for sharing that, Karma. That, that is very important um, to understand that how this gentrification that's moving Black people out of DC Okay, and where they may have before had reasonable price housing that was still high in DC, but more reasonable price housing. Now they're being pushed outside of DC into other areas and maybe pushed away from their family, away from resources, not having uh, the same type of transportation that's available to them in those particular cases. And this combination of seeing how domestic violence and all of those systems go together and sexual assault go together with all of those systems. So homelessness, um, as we look at it, disproportionately um, black women who are homeless are homeless because of domestic violence. That's why they're homeless. And so these things all go together as we see them in our community. Could we have someone else that would like to share what's happening in your community around blackness? My name is Bernita Walker. Um, one of the things that I noticed in the community that I live in, because I live in the same place that my parents brought me home to when I was born 74 years ago. So mm -hmm. naturally I've seen the difference from, we were the second black family on the block. Uh, and now it's primarily Hispanic, but I still live here. And what I see is that there's a lack of training in the schools our kids are not getting what they need to move forward as far as life skills are concerned. Um, the money is not there for the school systems in the Los Angeles area, in the areas where black children are, uh, even the busing is a problem in, in taking them so far away and not giving them what they need to sustain. I have a 37 year old grandson and he was the, at one point, he was the only black child in the school that he was going to, but he was going in, in another section, Monterey Park. So they used him in a sense, like um, because he was trying, one of those uh, children that needed to know what was going on and really understand what the classes were about. Most of them were speaking Spanish. The teacher would put him at the front of the classroom, right in front of the the, the blackboard 
knowing that he had a problem with his eyesight and that that was causing him to slow down on his uh, education. So those types of techniques are used consistently with our children when there are not individuals like ourselves that are taking to giving them the information that they Yes, thank you for sharing that. And clearly, as we look at Black families and how Black children are disproportionately given that title of ADHD, which used to be ADD, but they couldn't call it a disorder and they couldn't make any money, so they had to change it to ADHD in order to do that. And then how our children, our Black children, are streamlined right into um, those situations because maybe they didn't speak English, didn't mean they had ADHD, um, you know, <laughs> or anything like that, but maybe, um, but there was, there was this standard that, was, that is, was put on black children that made them automatically have problems within that school system. So thank you for sharing that as well. Someone else, what's happening in your community? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I just wanna share that, um... 12 years ago when I, you know, moved to America and when my sponsor picked me up from the airport and then now uh, we arrived to their home, that was not the home that I, you know, I was uh, expect to see or that was not the America that I was dreaming in, you know, that's not America that I was, or the house, the apartment, the beauty that I was uh, watching on the movie. And then I was like, I told and my heart, you know, I, I was 21, I can't, um, you know, I'm, I'm not from the city. I don't really uh, say much. I was pretty quiet girl. And then I said, you know, I said to myself, oh, here it's maybe where the first, you know, when we first camera or new camera, you know, arrive and then a few days or, you know, months later, I thought we go somewhere else. And I thought they took me to somewhere else. And then I asked my sponsor and I said, uh, so here's where are we going to leave? And <laughs> they were like, yes, this is our home. I said, okay. And then uh, a few days later, when they drove around and I was trying to see the community in the city and then I was like, oh, what? So this is America that we used to dream or just because of like, I'm from Africa. I thought like that the place like all Africans stay when they, you know, move to United States of America. And then, you know, that's what I thought. And that, uh, through like why I stay in America, I go to college and see everything. Now I know because at the time they, you know, drove me around Georgetown and different, you know, around the city, everywhere. So, and now I get it how, you know, the system has impacted our community. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, and speaking of the West Coast, I was out there a couple of years ago and hit, um, was talking to some friends I have there and they went a little bit into that history, particularly in talking about um, Berkeley and, you know, San Francisco, all of these big places where Black folk used to live <laughs> in those places. And again, with the gentrification and pushing them out, um, almost really stealing their homes, if not technically, stealing their homes and pushing them out and, um, uh, you know, putting them in places where they didn't want to live at that time. So it's very, very interesting how, again, as Karma said, the positioning of where we live and the resources that we have has just been very, very different, very cruel in some cases. Anyone else share, please? I would like to share. Thank this you. Doris O'Neill. I'm in Seattle, Washington. Mm -hmm. And what you were just speaking about, the gentrification of um, the areas, I grew up in what we used to call the central district. But it was, we call it, black folks call it the CD because it was really for the colored district. Once white folks moved in and moved everybody out, it became the central district because it's the central of Seattle. Um, myself as a black woman and a director over my program, I often find myself being the only one at the table um, and constantly having to put the African-American woman back in the center of the room because it's like we get hijacked, we get, um, you know, the conversation sways pretty easily. And so these last two or three weeks, it has been really trying and being at meetings where 
you know, I'm not the only person of color, but I am the only black woman at the table, is really talking about the African American woman and with our YWC, our mission statement is empowering women and eliminating racism. And so we do specialize for working specifically with um, black women. And so I um, created and developed and got funding for a program called, we call it the Survivors First. And it's working with survivors of gender-based violence who have been arrested or are about to be arrested. And I've partnered with our King County Prosecutor's Office and they are taking a second look at why black women are being arrested and the victimization that they have and the trauma and taking a deeper look at these cases and they are dismissing and declining these cases. And then the cases are referred to us where we are providing supportive services to the women so that they don't have to be in those positions anymore. We help them pay rent, we help them get their car fixed, we um, put them in hotels, all the basic things that a survivor stays in an abusive relationship for, we try to help her explore those options so that she's not in that position where she's being arrested. Because as we know, once the cuff goes on, life is never the same. And so this is, Seattle's predominantly a white city, you know, and so we don't make up much of the population, but we are um, constantly having to have those conversations more and more lately, and it's been pretty exhausting. Yes, and you know, that's a word that I've heard so much of here lately. I'm exhausted, yes. you know, um, and we have always been, it's always been hard. We used to say it's so hard. We just say it's so hard, but nowadays we hear Black women saying, I'm exhausted. Uh, it's like everything, all the wind has been taken out of me and, and I'm just exhausted. I'm yeah. trying to look in the chat and see that um, there are some questions here. Yes, how has racism shown up in your local communities and how has it impacted the safety of survivors? Thank you for adding that um, to the chat. And then people have responded, racist housing practices, inability to get into a house or an apartment Schools with less resources and prevention, sex ed is unavailable or underfunded. Uh, and then Melissa says also, dual arrest, more black women arrested when police think they are too aggressive, don't see them as victims. And so arrest both parties when responding to domestic violence. And that has been something um, that, that really has gone on for this long time ever since really the movement pushed for arrest as a policy. Um, and uh, black people, black women said in the movement said that's not gonna work. They're gonna overrepresent our black men as they're being arrested. And clear enough, that is what happened. Um, black men are being arrested more frequently. I'm not saying that black men, that there aren't some black men that should not be, that should be arrested. I'm saying that yes, but the investigation is not there. The investigation to determine primary aggressor is not there. And so, or, and what is the history of this that's going on with that family? Um, and so looking at what are other strategies that we develop in order to respond to domestic violence happening in the home. Um, because of the stereotype that black women are aggressive um, you know, even if we're yelling, we don't have to throw anything. We can just yell. Well, you know, you deserve to be hit. You shouldn't have been yelling at him. You deserve to be knocked out and hit in your mouth or whatever um, because of your attitude. You have this attitude. Um, Black women have had to take care of themselves throughout uh, history, not only in dealing with, uh, from the beginning, the rape and escape from white men who were disproportionately raping black women in our communities. I remember when my mother was followed home one day um, by a white man in a car um, and my oldest brother who jumped in the car and went looking for him. Thank God he didn't find him. So, you know, these things that happen in our community that we are very much aware of, but now also aware of how black men are still perpetrators of these crimes as well. And black women are being arrested um, at the same time that black men are being arrested because they're seen as being co-violent. 
when that's not an issue, it's self-defense. Um, and so we have to really look at how we're phrasing this, how we're dealing with the issue of domestic violence in our law, law enforcement system, um, with all the racism that exists within it, as well as how we continue to figure out how we heal our community from these horrible offenses that are being committed. Who else would like to share, please? A couple of more minutes. It's Roman James. Can I say something? Absolutely, Roman. Thank you. Um, one of the ways that in my particular um, experience of abuse is that uh, Black women are having their children taken away. It's estimated that uh, nationwide every year 58,000 children are displaced from their protective parent and put with an abuser or in systems like you know uh, foster care or juvenile or whatever the case may be um, i have from the beginning experienced the cognitive dissonance of the law enforcement and justice or legal system where um, someone who I got away from because I recognized very early on that he was abusive and um, got away from him before uh, I knew I was pregnant at 41. And the system has held me hostage to him through the courts. And the first experience of ever being in a court was through family court. When he filed trying to assert course of control over me through a child that he was while I was pregnant, constantly asking for me to terminate. Well, once I was in front of a white female judge and she asked me a question and I responded because he's abusive, her response was, you should have thought of that before you had a baby with him. And this is within 15 minutes of being, you know, I would say the first 10 or 15 minutes. This is the first time I had ever been in court. It has been an ongoing story of their ignoring the abuse, but more importantly, in terms of how the racial dynamics play out, in Long Beach especially, mostly black and brown women or um, Pacific Islander women were being shuttled through these courts and I fortunately had the uh, self-possession to understand that it wasn't just me because I was seeing every single black and brown woman talk to in abusive ways by the judges, uh, every single black and brown woman being held to unreasonable standards um, against uh, fathers who were oftentimes abusive and seeing the difference in how the female judge would respond to the few white women who came through her court or the white attorneys versus my black female attorney. Um, even in terms of, at one point, I, my black female attorney associated in a Persian male attorney and how she was so disrespectful to you know, it, it became a, a situation where you start to under understand it's better to have a white attorney versus someone of color because they they don't even respect the the their peers who are of color. And so, when you're talking about racism and the pipeline to incarceration, it begins with our children. It begins with taking our children away. Um, I'm fortunate I still have 50-50 custody and I'm fighting to remove my child from this person, but I can't tell you the number of women, a veteran, nice. two veterans that I know, um, a woman and women who have no history of drug abuse, no history of abuse or neglect, no jail time. The man who fathered my child is a documented abuser. I found that out through his record being leaked to me by county council. But yet I am held, you know, as if I were having to defend my right to be in my child's life. Uh, and it doesn't matter. 
I, I'm college educated. I have a degree in the STEM field. I was working and independent. I've never done drugs. Uh, I'm not out swinging on a pole, but yet I am constantly brought into the system, whether I want to or not, to defend my, my right to be in my child's life. And it, and it, and it, it showed me how the, the inherent patriarchy of the system, which, you know, births everything from racism to sexism, classism, is even working in favor of men of color. Okay. It is a matter of being a woman. It is a matter of being a black woman in terms of my encounters with police. I haven't had so many encounters with police until I met this person, but yet their interface with me is, you're the problem. I had a detective tell me, you need to stop this. And all I was asking for was a report because he had made a false report against me. You need to stop this. You're a good looking woman. You know, there's, there's a number of guys who would love to be with you. This is how he's talking to me with my child in my hand is I'm just requesting to find out because I had never had a, a, you know, been reported as a crime and the officer had referred me to him, but he chose to condescend to me about how good looking I am and how I need to just get a man and stop. He never met me before. It wasn't a crime scene. I had just gone to the front desk of Pacific division and this was a black man. And this was, a detective who, you know, had been in the ranks for years. And this is how his interface with me was, well, you're a black woman, so I'm gonna talk to you like this. It's disgusting. Yes. And it's, um, it's historical and it's institutionalized within the way that it's perpetrated. And there are constantly more discourse scenarios that are built up around us to ensure that our intersectionality between race and gender will be always marginalized. Um, and that's the plan for them, to marginalize us. Because as we talked about, where are we marginalized? Because we're a woman, because we're black. Um, you were fortunate you had resources that you could fight this on some level. Um, you know, to fight for your children. But if we think about the intersectionality of poverty with that, what would a black woman who had no resources been able to do except go home and cry that her child was taken away from her? And so, you know, looking at these points of who we are doesn't free us up from this discrimination. It's just what does it look like as a black woman who is also all of these other things? in our identity and what does it look like for our safety and well-being um, in our society today. I really want to thank all of you for participating. Thank you so much. Um, I really hope that things work out, Roman, for you and your child. So sorry to hear that you're struggling with that. Um, I, I appreciate everyone who participated and listened. Uh, I am available. If you have questions, then you can continue to put information in the chat and I can respond to you. Karma, returning it back to you. Sure, so thank you, Umi, and thank you, um, Roman, for sharing your story and lifting up um, the challenges within the child welfare system um, and within the legal system as it relates to um, children. So thank you to everyone. Thank you, Umi, for that presentation. We are going to take a 15 minute break. So we'll come back together at four o'clock and um, we will rejoin as Ayana um, starts with her presentation, uh, She's Too Strong. So, so um, in 15 minutes, we're gonna ask everyone to come back. Please take a real break. So take some time to grab some water, grab something to drink, and we'll see you at four o'clock.
your break. I hope you actually took it, got some water, got some, you know, things to snack on or whatever. Um, again, my name is Ayana Rollins. I'm the same specialist with Kojima. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, just very quickly about me, um, my background is in women's and gender studies. I have both my undergraduate and graduate degrees in women's and gender studies. Um, my areas of research were in um, violence in communities of color, specifically intimate partner violence, sexual violence, um, reproductive violence, and medicalized racism. So I'd like to talk about all the things that I can and how they impact, impact Black women and girls' lives. Um, let's see. Hold on. My sound is... Can you hear me a little better now? Okay. Um, and so after grad school, I went and I worked at a shelter, a domestic violence shelter for several years as a case manager. Um, so I saw a lot of good things. I, saw, I met a lot of amazing survivors. Um, but I also saw a lot of systems gaps in the response um, to survivors, specifically Black women. Um, and so after working in shelter for some time, I went and I worked at the Maryland Coalition Against Domestic Violence, which is the state coalition on DV. Um, I initially joined the lethality assessment team where I was traveling nationally, working with both um, domestic violence service providers and law enforcement on how to actually implement the LAP and then what to do when you have you know, more calls for service from high lethality victims. Um, so I worked on that team for a while and then switched over to the actual Maryland training team where I then became the lead trainer for that team before coming to Ujima, where I've now been for almost a year. Um, and it's just been such a welcoming home moment for me. Um, and I love my team and I love everything about them. So one thing that you will quickly notice is that I look down because I'm looking at my notes because I talk a lot and I get really excited about these conversations. So I will stick to my notes as much as possible, but I love to have interactive conversations. So I definitely challenge you all to turn your cameras on, um, challenge you all to take yourself off of mute or use the chat box, however you want to communicate. Um, I encourage you to do so. So Sahida, you got my slides, right? All right, so Sahida's gonna pull up the slides for me because I am a tech challenge millennial and it's just easier when Sahida helps me out. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. So the name of this workshop is She's Too Strong, Understanding the Intersections of Massage Noir, Domestic Violence and Victimization. And next. And so, go back one more. And so I give this disclaimer that this workshop has and can bring up a range of trauma reactions for folks in the audience. So remember your self-care. I'm not offended if you know you have to have your camera off or you need to step away, get some water, take a woosah break, whatever you need to do to do it for yourself to make sure you can get through this and we can have this honest and open conversation, please do so. Um, and the goal for today is really, for the rest of this workshop, is really to have an in-depth conversation about um, violence as it's impacted Black women specifically. Um, this is still a pretty mainstream, or not mainstream, or pretty US-based um, uh, context, but the sim similar experiences have happened to Black women throughout the diaspora, so I want to acknowledge that. Um, and again, take care of yourself in whatever way you need. So I have some workshop agreements to start us off. I have some workshop agreements to start us off. Um, that includes active listening. So it's really easy to get distracted when you're on Zoom. Because um, emails come through, you know, you might get a text message or whatever, but just try to be actively engaged in the conversation. Um, be present, silence that internal chatter. So my mom always says, I know you hear me, but are you listening? Um, and that's because when I hear something I don't necessarily like, I usually go to my rebuttal mode where I'm trying to get my thoughts together instead of actually listening and absorbing what she's saying. So just silence that internal ch chatter as much as possible. Uh, be open. So we're all coming into this conversation from different lenses, different viewpoints and experiences, but be open to what other folks may be sharing. Uh, push through that growing edge. Again, we're all coming into this with different levels of experience of talking about these topics or different levels of lived experience when we're talking about privilege or intersectionality. Um, just push through and know that Folks on this call are operating from best intention. 
uh, respectfully challenge each other. We all don't have to agree. I don't think we all should agree. I think it would be a very boring world, but we want to as respectfully challenge each other as possible. Lean in and lean out. So if you felt like, you know, you haven't really been actively, as actively participating as you would want, lean into the conversation. If you feel like you may have been taking up space and want to offer space for others, lean out. Um, but again, I always encourage folks to be act as actively engaged as you can. And then the last point is to continue to have these conversations because there's literally no point in having these workshops, having this regional meeting, if the then the information is going to just stay in the room. I um, mean, want to make sure that people are actually talking to each other, that people are talking to each other across states, across communities, and that way we'll really be able to narrow in different ways to support and uplift Black women and girls. So next slide. And so before we really get going, I want to take a very intentional moment to recognize Black women throughout the diaspora. I want to recognize stolen African women whose blood courses through my veins whose resilience and strength and skill and love has been passed down from generation to generation, um, and especially Black women who were considered too strong or too undeserving to get help, but somehow still made it and continue to make it. And so I'm going to read a short poem by Marie Evans. It's entitled, I am a Black woman, um, to center us, and then we're going to keep going. So, I'm a Black woman. The music of my song, Some Sweet Arpaggio of Tears, is written in a minor key and I can be heard humming in the night. I saw my mate leap screaming to the sea, and I with these hands cup the life breath from my issue in the cane break. I lost Nate's swinging body in a rain of tears and heard my son scream all the way from Anzio for peace he never knew. I learned Da Nang and Pork Chop Hill in my anguish. Now my nostrils know the gas and these trigger tired fingers speak the softness in my warrior's beard. I'm a black woman. Tall as a cypress, strong, beyond all definition still, defying place and time and circumstance, assiled, impervious, indestructible, look on me and be renewed. And so let's go ahead and jump into it. So the big question, what is massage noir? What does it mean? What does it look like? We know it was a term coined by black queer feminist scholar, and Professor Moya Bailey back in 2010 to describe the specific ways in which racism and misogyny combine to uh, oppress Black women. So when you think of it, it's Black womanhood and misogyny, how they collide um, to impact the experiences of Black women and girls. But what is it? What is it really? Well, how does it show up in the world? Use your chat box or take this off me. How have we seen it show up? So one example that I give is in it's Massage Noir is in 2014 when Don Imus felt entitled enough to call the black women on the Rutgers basketball team nappy headed hoes on live radio. It's the constant and still persistent attacks of former First Lady Michelle Obama, who was called everything from classless to ape like to ghetto to uneducated all things we know to be untrue. And she was one of the most educated first ladies we've ever had. But what else is it? How does it show up? Um, it showed up for me in the workplace where um, last year I was asking a upper level manager, um, white male, about um, a change that had been made and it was a change that affected my position or 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 responsibilities and so he said whoa you don't have to be so angry and <laughs> I was nowhere near angry but because I was asserting a position the reaction is you're angry you know you're the angry black woman and i said to him directly i said listen do not go there with me projecting the angry black woman trope oh roman i would never like i can't believe you said that i said but i said i'm not angry 
you know, I'm having a conversation with you and your assertion began with that word, which means that you're trafficking in, you know, ideas about who I am because I'm challenging and just really trying to get answers. I wasn't even challenging him. I was just trying to get answers. So, you know, seeing black women regarded as angry for speaking up, being empowered, um, and, you know, asking for answers that, you know, in any other situation, in any other circumstance with anyone would be respected. But it's not because, you know, of ideas that people hold, you know, the implicit bias people have about Black women. Great, thank you. Um, Tony added the complete dismissal of us and our voice. Um, white women in the workplace saying, I don't see color. What else? What else is it? How does it show up? Tony's point makes me think of how even the founder of the Me Too movement, Tarana Burke, was left out of the conversation for a long time, was left out of magazine covers. And she is the person that put us on to even understand what that means. And if you don't necessarily know what massage noir is yet, we'll keep going and you'll have a much more clear understanding of it. So next slide. So some historical context, I feel, is really important to the conversations of how did we get where we are in terms of our treatment of Black women. Um, so next slide. So we're going to go over a couple different concepts. Um, the concept of rape as applied to Black women, the reality of slave rape and breeding farms, Sally Hemings' story, sexual terror and lynching during the Jim Crow and civil rights decades, birth control testing and forced sterilization, Centoya Brown's story, missing girls in D.C., sex workers and st how stigma leads to violence, and then a little just a smidge around labor, work, and the truth around government handouts. So that'll give us our base for this conversation. Okay. So the reality of slave rape and breeding farms, uh, the reality of slave rape is that it was pervasive. Uh, no black woman was exempt from either being raped or the constant threat of rape. Um, a lot of people, there's this conversation, a lot of people think that or will say that, oh, well, you're lighter skinned, so you would have been better off because you would have been in the house and not in the field picking cotton. But the reality is, when you were in the house, you were just in that much closer proximity to your rapist. It did not exempt you from violence. It did not mean that you were better off. You were still a slave, and you were still subject to that violence that was so persistent. Um, and so a lot of people then don't understand or have no, no idea of the history of breeding farms, which were specifically designed to perpetuate the business of slavery. Um, on breeding farms, Black folk and Black slave women in particular were forced to have sex with whoever was available. Um, black slave women were a lot of times expected to maintain a quota of successful pregnancies. Um, in some cases, the slave owner would say, um, if you bear me a, you know, a certain amount of children, you might get your freedom. So if you bear me 15 children that are good stock that I can then beat, sell, rape, maybe kill, bear me 15 of those, you might get your freedom. That was the promise. Um, and so when I say whoever was available, that's what I mean. Uh, black women were at many times forced to have sex with several different slave men that could have included their own children, their brothers, their uncles. And so when we think about language and the history of language, this is where the term mother effort comes from. So again, we have to think about the violence that is rooted in language and in our discourse as well. Next slide. So who is Sally Hemings? Somebody tell me who she is. Thomas Jefferson's concubine. So Thomas Jefferson's concubine, right? That's a narrative that we're fed over and over again. She was his mistress. She was his concubine. Um, but really what those terms do is negate the fact that she was a slave and sexual slave to a former sitting president. Like that's, that's the reality of it. Um, and so those labels, they really erode um, the fact that 
She herself was a child of slave rape. She bore six of his children as a product of slave rape. She was kept in a windowless brick room that was adjoined to his room. Um, and she died, I think, not, not even 12 years after she was finally granted freedom, after one of her children bought her freedom for her. Um, but when we think about autonomy and agency and being able to decide what happens to your body, we see historically that Black women have never been given a choice about what happens to us and what happens to our body. We've never been given ownership of our own sexuality. Instead, it's been determined by other folks who will enact violence on us when we don't do what they want to do, or we don't do um, what they expect us to do, or act how they expect us to act. Next slide. Oh, let me, give me one second. Let me see if I can call in because I know the sound is going in and out still. Hey, Sahia, can you actually read me the meeting ID while I call because it's not letting me look at it? Yes. Are you ready? Can y'all hear me now? 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 Does that work? Yes. Okay. All right. So let me go back to my notes so I know where to pick up. Okay, so of course, sexual terror didn't stop when slavery ended. We know that. Uh, rape has and continues to be used as a weapon of terror against the minds and bodies of black folk. Uh, the rape of black women by white men largely continued um, going unpunished throughout, Jim, throughout the Jim Crow era. As Reconstruction collapsed and Jim Crow took its place, White men would abduct and rape or even gang rape black women with alarming regularity. White men would lure black women to, and girls to their homes with the promise of stable work, reasonable pay, um, and then would attack them as they worked as nannies or as um, caregivers or maids in the house. And so white men would regularly kidnap and rape women on their way, on their way to and from work, home, church, school as a way to reinforce the racial and economic hierarchies. So I think of this era as, um, as lynching was to black men in this era, rape was to black women. Um, not to say that black men weren't raped, not to say that black women weren't lynched, but overwhelmingly that was the experience. So in, ma and in many ways, um, because the civil rights movement has been scaled down and presented as a movement led by men, Black women's quest for equality and nonviolence has largely been erased, and Black women's true positioning in the movement has largely been overlooked. And so this is um, one of the cases, uh, the case of Recy Taylor stands out uh, for many reasons, but in her experience, she was an Abbo native who was kidnapped and raped by six gun-wielding, knife-toting white men. 
um, as she was walking home from church on September 3rd, 1944. The NAACP actually assigned activist Rosa Parks to investigate the case, but it never went to trial because an all-white male grand jury refused to indict the men. And so the Alabama legislature apologized for the miscarriage of justice back in 2011, but that doesn't, that doesn't take away from the fact that this was her experience and this was the experience of so many other black women who didn't have voice to tell their story. And so I believe her documentary is still on Hulu. I think it was on Netflix for a time, but if you're interested in learning more about her story and more about that time period in particular, I definitely recommend it. I also recommend reading this book by Danielle McGuire. It's entitled At the Dark End of the Street, and it really goes um, in depth into the era and what happened to Black women regarding rape. Next slide. So what's thought of as one of the championing moments for the women's rights movement was access to birth control, uh, the pill in particular. Approximately a third of women taking contraceptive measures rely on the pill, but most have no idea of its dark history. Uh, before the pill was marketed and distributed to white American women as a symbol of independence and bodily autonomy, it was tested on the bodies of black and brown women in Hawaii, Puerto Rico, psychiatric wards, prisons, jails, urban cities, um, and largely resulted in mass sterilization, major birth defects, and other reproductive issues. Uh, many poor and poor women of color were either coerced or forced into taking the pill um, or the Depo-Provera shot, and then were prevented from stopping taking the medication despite experiencing severe bleeding, cramping, and miscarriage. Many women delivered what were called jellyfish babies, because they were born without bones and with very translucent skin as a result of being tested on, basically. Um, and so the history of Black women's bodies and testing um, is why you'll sometimes hear folks from within the Black community say, you know, birth control was Black genocide because they've taken a piece of that history um, and really scaled it down. But what's more in line to what Black women need is reproductive justice. So we have to be able to have those conversations as well. Next slide. So who is Sinsoya Brown? Somebody tell me who she is. Go ahead, Roman. <laughs> she was a, uh, a, a child sex trafficking victim, a teen sex trafficking victim who was convicted of murdering the man she was sold to for basically sexual enslavement. They gave her an egregiously long, harsh sentence and her story came to light. I'm not exactly sure how, but um, there became, you know, a movement to free Centoya Brown. And so she's now free and married, an author, and I just hope that she continues to prosper in life. Great, thank you. Um, so Zentoya Brown was just 16 years old when she was charged and convicted as an adult after she shot and killed the John who had bought her for the night from her pimp named Cutthroat. And I think that's really important because people think that at 16 years old, well, really at any age, are you really gonna challenge someone whose nickname is Cutthroat? Like, let's think about that. Um, but Centoya tried to explain that she shot him out of fear that he was planning to kill her that night. But the prosecutor and now district attorney in Madison, Georgia, contended that she shouldn't be considered a victim of trafficking, that instead she was a thief, that she conspired to kill that man, and basically it was her own fault. Um, so the story only came to light um, after Black activists were saying, hey, 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 she is a child trafficking victim. We know what the law says in terms of trafficking. Why are we not regarding her in the same way? And so she actually um, got released at the end of last, the very end of last year, after serving about 15 years in jail for simply defending herself. And her story is not, um, is not a one-off. It's not something that just happened to just her. Um, it's happening all over the country and it's happening to black girls uh, specifically who aren't being valued as victims or not being treated um, the same way that white trafficking or teens who are trafficked who are white are treated. Um, next slide. Anybody heard about the missing girls in DC? 
Hope so. Some of us. And if you haven't, um, it's not shocking because it's still information that's held back or repressed. Um, so the story actually, so DC has logged over 500 plus cases of missing juveniles, the majority being black and Latinx. Um, the story actually broke because within a two week span, 10 children of color went missing with very little media attention. Um, and so there were some stats put out that were factually incorrect, but then the DC government responded and say, hey, hey, this is happening, but it's not at those rates. Um, according to a 2014 FBI crime stat, nearly 40% of all missing persons under the age of 18 were black. Next slide. Natalie Wilson, the co-founder of Black and Missing Foundation says, we noticed that a lot of African-American children that go missing are initially classified as runaways. They don't get an Amber Alert or media coverage. And in 2016, an estimated one out of six endangered runaways reported to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children were likely child sex trafficking victims. Of those, 86% were in the care of the foster care system or child welfare. So we're seeing how gaps in services, how gaps um, across systems are really allowing children to be abducted or allowing children to be more vulnerable um, to folks who are predators. And if we know that one out of six endangered runaways is likely a child sex trafficking victim, and we're saying no black children aren't being trafficked, they're runaways, why can't we then still see the connection? That, that's a question that comes up for us or has to come up for us. So next slide. So in 2016, Oklahoma City police officer Daniel Holtzclaw was convicted of 18 out of 36 counts, including four counts of first degree rape and four counts of forced oral sodomy after intentionally preying on African American women over a six, six month span the year prior. Holtzclaw had in intentionally chosen one of the city's poorest neighborhoods to play on women, prey on women in the community with the assumption that the victim's drug and or prostitution records would undermine any investigation or claims against him. 13 of his victims testified against him and ranged in age from a 17-year-old girl to a 57-year-old grandmother. Um, one 24-year-old victim who had been intoxicated when she was arrested by Hawksclaw testified that he had transported her to the hospital for detox with the promise that he was going to drop the charges if she went. And but while she lay handcuffed to her hospital bed, he raped her. And then following her rape, he then continued stalking her by using uh, law enforcement technology and by using social media. Um, and there was very little national media uh, media attention to this. Um, but the fact that he was actually charged and convicted was a major win for black women all over the country. And next slide. So labor, work, and the truth about government handouts, again, this is just a, a little smidge um, talking about these, these notions. So let's be clear, and I want to be very clear, um, this is something I do not argue. Black women have always worked. Whether it was in the field or as a nanny in white families' homes, black women have never just been lazy or just been looking, out, looking for handouts as the racist stereotype would have you believe. So when we talk about welfare and housing and work, a lot comes up to folks. Um, a lot of people talk about how the breakdown of the traditional fa American family is the root cause of black poverty. But when we really think about and when we look at the historical context surrounding black families, black families have never actually been allowed to be quote unquote traditional. Um, and with that explanation, we're not only placing blame on black families for their poverty, um, for oppression that they experience. We're also really overlooking the historical context of black women workers and the impact the government programs um, and the welfare system have had in particular. Uh, until 1968, the nation's primary welfare program, which was called the AIDS to Families with Dependent Children, would regularly deny benefits, with, benefits to families if an adult male was in the house. Um, they would often conduct midnight raids, which they were literally going out at midnight to knock on folks' doors to see if a man was in the home or an adult, adult son was in the home. And if they were, then the family's benefits would be terminated. 
And so with because of con continued discriminatory housing and employment practices, um, black men were really pushed out of the home um, because the black family, the family needed support in whichever way they could get it. So black men were pushed out of the home and black women were pushed further into the uh, primary or head of household role um, or family breadwinner role. Um, there's also a lot, yeah, there's also a lot more stigma attached to single black mothers than there is attached to single white mothers. Um, real estate agents knew this and as what they called um, block busting, it was called block busting, they would hire black families and black mothers to walk from the ghettos to walk up and down the street in mixed neighborhoods as a way to encourage white homeowners to move out of the city and into the suburbs while also preventing through things like redlining black families from leaving the city. So as Umi mentioned, ghettos were intentionally created. Um, people don't like to use the word because the connotation it has, or don't, they don't like to think of that concept because the con connotation it has with the Holocaust and what happened to our Jewish brothers and sisters. But you see a lot of parallels when you actually do some research. And next slide. And so when we think about popular narratives and socialization, when we think about why there's this constant narrative of the angry black woman, again, a lot comes up. So racialized, racialized uh, sexual tropes emerged during the sex, uh, slave eras, but have continued to be perpetuated and passed down from generation to generation. Um, we've also seen an evolution of many of these tropes as well, um, but it's really important to think of them as they've created narratives for who black women are. So the myth of the matriarch, the mammy and the Jezebel images all came directly out of slavery. Uh, the matriarch, was seen as overbearing, drove men away, as a workhorse, um, as someone who could reproduce but wasn't desirable. Then we have the mammy. I also, I always think uh, Shirley Temple era, um, the happy slave, loved to serve, happy with their station in life and was largely asexual, uh, but they were taking care of everyone else or the white slave owner's children. And then we have the Jezebel. She was hypersexualized. Uh, sexually available and indiscriminate, flirtatious, and so whatever sexual violence was enacted upon her, she deserved it because she put herself out there too much. Um, and then later on, closer to the civil rights movement and the war on drugs, we saw an evolution of these narratives or evolution of these tropes with the welfare queen, the sapphire, and the black superwoman. Uh, the welfare queen was seen as lazy, scamming the system, doesn't want to work, but is a baby machine. The Sapphire, she is the Neo Jezebel image, um, loud, angry, exploits men for money, basically a gold digger. Um, so by Felicia, that's sort of that, that uh, personification of the Sapphire um, from the movie Friday, if you haven't seen it. And then the black superwoman can, will, and wants to do it all, doesn't need a partner, um, definitely doesn't need a man, doesn't need anybody to, to support her. She can do it all on herself. And of those tropes, the black superwoman uh, initially seems like it's um, more, it's less negative than the others. But the reality of it is it doesn't allow for black women to be complex. It doesn't allow for black women to be vulnerable. It doesn't allow for black women to be seen as deserving or needing of help. And so all of these tropes have really informed the ways in which we look at black women, the ways in which we, have, we as black women have had to uh, control our emotions or attempt to control our emotions at all times um, and really our, our inability to then um, not show up as whole people because we don't want to be deemed as angry black women for simply asking a question. And it happens all the time to Roman's part, Come on, Roman's point. Next slide. And so this is what I call the black woman child. Um, Umi spoke to this a little earlier as well, but um, Girlhood Interrupted, the Erasure of Black Girls' Childhood was um, produced by Georgetown Law, the Center of Poverty and Inequality. And this study really for the first time provided data that adults view black girls as less innocent and more adult-like than their white peers, especially in the age range of five to 14. They actually redid, redid this study, I think two years ago, and the age dropped 
to age, beginning at age three, black girls are thought of in the following ways. The next slide. So again, compared to white girls of the same age, beginning at age three, black girls are seen as needing less nurturing, needing to be protected less, needing to be supported less, comforted less, as more independent, as knowing more about adult topics and knowing more about sex. Um, all things where you really, when you really think about it, how would they just automatically know these things? So the conversation is a hashtag, hashtag fast tailed girls, um, really speaks to how black girls are over hypersexualized or over sexualized beginning at very young ages. Um, this quote here says, black girls are regularly blamed for experiencing puberty early as if the presence of her body alone is consent. Next slide. Oh, go back one. Um, and with all this being said, uh, black women have been fighting for ourselves and for other women of color for a long time. Um, with the emergence of womanism and third wave feminism, black women were more able and boldly pushed back against misogynoir and against all the different isms that showed up in our life and in society. Um, so womanism is a direct response to first and second wave feminism, where even in the feminist movement, uh, white feminist women were saying, hey, black women, yes, yeah, support our goals, but be at the back of the parade line. Um, we don't want you up here. We don't want you in front with us because it's going to be a distraction. Um, actively working against eugenics, which is really population, quote unquote, population design. Um, it was very popular with the Nazis, we'll say. Um, and so people don't like to think of it being in an American context or think of it as having happened in America, but it absolutely did. Um, some, some very popular face, first wave eugenicists were Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Margaret Sanger, who is known as the founder of Planned Parenthood. So again, we see how some of these narratives have shifted um, based on the history that we know and don't know. Um, it was a celebration of intersectionality, um, specifically the intersections of race, class, and gender to really evaluate what that means in our lives as black women. Um, really looking at representation and agency and why it's important that black women see other examples of black women thriving and doing well. It was a celebration, not just an acknowledgement of diversity. It was a celebration to say, yes, we are different. No, we don't all need the same thing. No, we're not all just the same, you know, one woman. Um, we need different things and that should be okay. And then it was really acknowledgement of the fact that we need to bring black men and boys along as well, because they are part of our community and we can't just leave folks out. Uh, next slide. Closing stats and facts specific to black women, 41% of black women have experienced physical violence by an intimate partner during their lifetime. Most African-American and Afro-Caribbean women have experienced lifetime intimate partner abuse, um, reported psychological and physical abuse at 31%, and a combination of psychological, sexual, and physical abuse at around 30%. According to the CDC, Black women and American Indian or Native, Alaskan Native women experienced the highest rates of homicide, and over half of all homicides were related to intimate partner violence. The average age of, oh, sorry, next slide. <laughs> the average age of Black female homicide victims is five years younger than the average age of other women. 43% of domestic violence survivors are arrested along with their abusive partners or as a result of complaints lodged by their abusive partners were living below the poverty line. 66% were Black or Latinx. And Black women ages 25 to 29 are 11 times more likely as white women in the same age group to be murdered while pregnant or within the first year after childbirth. Next slide. So then we really have to think about how do we identify barriers how do we identify challenges when we want to actually support black, black survivors? Uh, next slide. And before we delve further into privilege, power, identity, we really have to acknowledge and think through the connections between identities and various systems or power structures. So let's do this activity. 
Um, let's start with this. Who is the most normalized person in our society? How do they show up? Who, who do they look like? And feel free to use the chat box or take yourself off mute. Who is the most normalized person in our society? White, cis man, male. White, cisgender, male. What else? Christian. What else? What else? I know y'all know. Able bodies. Wealthy. Heterosexual. Heterosexual. Healthy. Yep. What else? American. American. I'll add English speaking to that. What else? Masculine, attractive, employed, absolutely. And so if that is the most normalized person in our society, how are those norms then maintained? By oppression. Through social code, by oppression. What else? Being pushed out of uh, religious traditions. If you're, you know, anything other than cis or heterosexual. Absolutely. What else? Uh, prison pipelines, whether it's from probation. Uh juvenile justice pushing uh, children, literal children into the prison pipeline uh, through expulsion. Black girls are exposed, ex expo expelled at much higher rates than white girls um, in the school systems, education systems, pushing them out. Girls are pushed out. Thank you. And so we see that these norms are maintained by the isms that we have to navigate, right? By violence, by othering, by fat shaming, transphobia. That's how the norm is maintained. And then it's further maintained through the system. So I think it was Roman who just spoke, uh, Roman's point, you know, black girls being basically shuttled off to the prison system from very young ages from within the school system. Um, what other systems are present in our lives and might be oppressive? More black. So the prison system. One. Sorry, say again. Housing. Yep. Um, more black the women. Education promotion in their jobs. That's the reason why black women are the largest group of um, entrepreneurs and business owners because they're denied promotions and pay raises. Absolutely. So the glass ceiling we know as a thing, but for black women, that ceiling is even thicker to get through. Um, capitalism, the economy, our immigration system, legislation. So a lot of these systems we're constantly navigating or having to navigate, but they're inherently oppressive to black women in particular. Next slide. And so when we think about systems, we also have to think about and talk through what privilege is and how it shows up. Um, a lot of, I've found that actually a lot of folks have a real misunderstanding of what privilege is and why it's important to even talk about it. So what is privilege? It's the unearned special right, advantage, benefit, or favor granted to and or enjoyed by an individual or specific group of people. Two big reminders. Having privilege does not mean that an individual will not or has not experienced hardship, and all people are both privileged and non-privileged in certain aspects of their lives. Next slide. 
So there are a whole bunch of different types of privileges that we could talk about, but again, we don't have time for all of that. So we're gonna narrow it down to just a few examples. Um, one of the easiest that I feel people are able to talk about is male privilege. Um, male privilege is a set of advantages and benefits given to, given to men as a class due to their institutional power in relation to women. Big reminder, every man benefits from male privilege in our society, but every man also experiences privilege differently due to his intersecting identities, other forms of privilege and or oppression that he experiences, and the social capital that he holds as well. So what does male privilege look like on a societal level? How does it show up? Pay inequity. Pay inequity, the fact that men get paid more than women. What else? Men are in more positions of power. Men are given uh, positions of power. Yep, what else? Well, speaking from my experience, um, what most people don't understand about custody is that uh, when men fight for custody, and it has been statistically or empirically proven that men who go after full custody are typically controlling or abusive, they get custody majority of the time. There is gender bias in the courts that was proven empirically by research conducted by Joan Myers, a law professor at George Washington University. Her report was released uh, last year, mid-year, maybe like May. And it showed that upon review of like over 5,000 cases from across the country, that um, abusive fathers were often getting custody over protective mothers. And it's just a matter of the way that the legal system is set up. Yeah, thank you. Let's go to the next slide, Fahita. So on a societal level, male privilege shows up in that men can dominate conversations without being judged or being seen as too talkative. Men get paid more than women. Men are allowed to take up more physical space. It's called manspreading. Um, I've had, you know, manspreading is when you know, you're on the bus or sitting in a seat next to someone and the guy has their legs really wide spread open. Um, so you have to sort of crunch down in the corner. Um, I had a participant push back to say, well, I'm a large guy, I need more space. And I pushed back to say, I'm a large woman and I'm still expected to close my legs. Um, so privilege shows up in that way. Mansplaining as well. Um, being able to walk down the street or uh, without being told to smile, harass, grab your cat calls. Um, I don't think I've heard a man ever tell another man to smile, but they say it to women all the time. Um, men can live as bachelors or decide not to have children without being told they're going against their natural instincts. Um, and men are largely uh, encouraged to sow their wild oats or have multiple sex partners before settling down without being slut shamed. Next slide. So male privilege shows up in domestic violence and sexual violence as well. Um, it shows up right on the power and control wheel that us advocates love so much. Um, treating their partner as a servant, being the one to make all the big decisions, acting like the master of the castle, what I say goes, um, being the one to define men's and women's roles and then enact the punishment when the person doesn't follow through with their expectations. Um, and something we've been talking about um, throughout this, these two workshops placing all the responsibility for protecting the children on the mothers instead of on both parents. Next slide. Um, imagery is also really important to how narratives are crafted or shaped. Um, if you do a quick Google search, you'll find some really interesting things pop up. Like this first one, um, let's be honest, if Sandra Bland had a husband, she probably would be alive today. Marriage matters, who's your protector? Um, that's just, Ridiculous. I think if she had a husband and he, if he were there, they would both probably be dead. Um, her husband, the presence of him alone would not have protected her. Um, say her name, the fact that black women and girls are killed at very high rates by the police as well, but our stories are left out of the narrative or left out of the conversation. Um, someone, Mercedes um, put in the chat, mansplaining, that's what's going on in this bottom picture where they were talking about um, catcalling 
and the male male host said, you know, well, women, what you really want is to be catcalled. Um, you know, that's what you get dressed up for. That's what you put on makeup for. And they're like, no, we're just trying to like go to the grocery store and get milk. Like we're not trying to have to deal with all that. Um, and then what we saw very clearly what happened with Janet Jackson and Justin Timberlake at the Super Bowl when he pulled her top off at the end of the song. Um, she was been blacklisted from the Super Bowl basically, and he was just allowed to perform a couple years ago. Um, next slide. So white privilege. Um, the unearned institutional advantages and benefits given to white people by virtue of a system that has established whiteness as the norm and most esteemed. Two big reminders. Pointing out white privilege is not reverse racism. Um, we're not talking about individual privilege. We're talking about systemic privilege. And then pointing out white privilege is not about being held responsible for what your ancestors did. It's really about acknowledging that certain systems were set up to benefit white folks over everybody else. And that's just the reality of it. Um, the more you're able to acknowledge where white privilege exists, the better you are to leverage whatever white privilege you may have. Um, and I think Umi mentioned as well that white privilege does exist in communities of color. It's called colorism. Um, it's when folks that are have a lighter complexion are more esteemed and more valued than folks that have a darker skin tone. Next slide. On a societal level, um, white privilege is being able to see, say things like I don't see race or that they're colorblind or all lives matter in response to certain movements or that you're tired of talking about race. How convenient because I live in black skin every day. I don't have the option of not being able to see things from that lens because it's life or death sometimes. I might not make it down the street if I don't acknowledge my position in the world. Um, having your history taught as a core curriculum where other histories are either silenced or taught as an elective. This is literally why we have Africana studies because we weren't taught it in school outside of Black History Month. And even then it was relegated to Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, and sometimes Malcolm X. Um, I don't think I ever had any type of Asian Pacific Islander history taught in school outside of what happened with Pearl Harbor, right? Like that's, that's a little glimpse we would get. Um, being able to use flesh tone bandages or foundations that more or less match your skin tone. So before Fenty Beauty, these makeup lines were not checking for the super dark skin girls. They weren't checking for the super light skin girls either. Um, but they really realized with Rihanna's Fenty Beauty how much people want access. Um, being able to go shopping alone or be, and be more or less certain you won't be followed or harassed. Being able to talk about racism without being seen as self-interested. I've never, or self-seeking, I've never heard one of my white ally friends be told they're playing the race card. That's something that does not happen to them. Um, being able to be late to a meeting without having that lateness be reflected on your race. And something simple like being able to fall asleep in your college dorm room without having the police called on you for trespassing. Again, that speaks to representation, that speaks to who is allowed in the space or not. So, how might white privilege show up on when we think about domestic and sexual violence? Mutual arrest. Mutual arrest, absolutely. What else? If the woman of color is dark complected, the police will say, I don't see any marks on your body. Absolutely, that's a great point. So if you are a, of a darker skin tone, a lot of times your bruises may not show up um, automatically or may not show up without the ultraviolet light. But simply saying, well, I don't see any bruises, I don't believe you, that's a lot of times how white privilege shows up. Great point. Uh, next slide. So anger is seen as a result of trauma and not based on stereotypes. Um, when you have white privilege, you're more likely to be believed as a true victim by police and advocates alike. Not having your immigration status uh, questioned upon entering shelter or when applying for services. Having your substance use acknowledged as a coping mechanism. So we've seen what's happened with the very, very different and stark responses to the opioid and heroin epidemics. Not to say that folks who are experiencing an op the opioid crisis don't, aren't deserving of help. We just see how, how vastly different those responses were for communities of color and for white communities. 
um, and being able to interact with staff and upper level management that more or less look like you. Um, a lot of black people, a lot of black women are working in the domestic violence field, but overwhelmingly the executive directors and upper level management are still almost all white um, in organizations. Next slide. Again, imagery is important. So saying things like, I don't see race, translation, I'm going to use my place of privilege to refute and deny the sufferings of those who don't have it. Walmart, would you, do you like to explain why one of your stores has a lock only on the black hair care product? In case you weren't aware, this is racist and wrong. Um, are black names weird or are you just racist? This has been a conversation that's been happening for forever. Um, and then <laughs> this one over here about boxer braids versus cornrows. Um, if I see another post about Kim Kardashian boxer braids, no, no, those are cornrows. We've been wearing them for a long time. But when we wear cornrows, they're seen as ghetto. They're seen as unprofessional. When someone who has white privilege wears them, they're seen as trendy and attractive. Next slide. So heterosexual privilege, um, the unearned advantages afforded to straight cisgender people, largely based on heteronormative or heterosexist ideology. Heteronormativity is the belief that people fall into distinct and complementary genders of either male or female or either straight or gay. It's not recognizing that there absolutely is a spectrum of gender and people fall at various points on it. Um, big reminder, heterosexual privilege reinforces the gender binary, patriarchal gender norms, upholds the notion of deviant sexuality, and is largely rooted in colonialism. Next slide. So on a societal level, straight people are never expected to come out as straight. I know I was never asked, when did you decide you were straight? That was never a conversation. Um, straight people are not, acute, or not accused of being abused, warped, or psychologically confused because of their sexual orientation. Straight people are not asked to speak for all other straight people. Straight people can be open about their sexual orientation and romantic relationships without having to worry about losing their jobs. And straight people can be sure that when they watch TV or read in magazines that there's someone from their sexual orientation um, will be represented. So somebody's pushed, um, I had a participant push back to say, well, there are a lot of TV shows that I don't identify, identify with, or there are a lot of TV shows that I, I, you know, I can't find a character that looks like me. But the reality is you can probably change the channel and find someone that you can connect with that doesn't fall into a trope and that doesn't fall into just being, you know, the trope of the witty, the witty gay best friend, right? We want to see more complex characters, even when that is part of someone's identity. We want to see complex characters come out. Next slide. So when it, oh, go back one. Can you just go back one? So in terms of domestic violence um, and heterosexual relationships, your partner can't threaten to out you as a form of control. And this is a very um, legitimate and very scary problem that happens when folks are outed because it could mean life or death. It can mean ostracization from your community. It can mean, you know, loss of job or loss of benefits. There are a lot of ramifications that come with it. Um, there is a shelter in every state that will house you for domestic violence. And you can be assured that when you enter shelter, you'll be more or less physically safe. A lot of folks who are in the LGBTQ community are referred to homeless shelter, which there are a lot of problems there and a lot of violence that is enacted on folks in the community. Um, there's less likelihood of being questioned as a primary aggressor or as being seen as mutually combative in an abusive relationship. There's this narrative happening that folks who are gay or folks that are lesbian are mutually combative, even though we know that there's a primary aggressor in every relationship. Um, and advocates and law enforcement personnel will not inaccurately assume the gender or pronoun of yourself or your partner. Um, this is something as well that we really have to think about pronouns and what it means in terms of inclusion and what it means in terms of um, gender bias when we're thinking about how do we, how do we call people what they need to be called? How, we, how do we name people in the name that they respond to? And again, narrative. So transphobia, where black women are being told, black trans women are being told, you'll never be a real woman. Um, conversations about the homosexual agenda, as if it isn't just to you know, spend time with family, buy milk, create equality. 
Um, there's still a conversation within the LGBTQ move, um, community of whether or not to add the brown and black stripes to the flag, which is like, why wouldn't you want to be more inclusive? But even within the community, there is racism and misogynoir and all of these other isms that folks are dealing with. Um, and then in terms of safety, do you affirm yourself and get yelled at, or do you not affirm yourself and still potentially experience violence? These are constant um, questions that folks are having to deal with and navigate in our world. Next slide. And then class privilege. Um, class privilege is the advantage of being afforded a higher social ranking based on income, wealth, education, status, power, status position, and power. Class privilege is not solely based on economic capital, but it's influence on social and cultural capital as well. Does anybody want to explain what I mean by social and cultural capital? Well, if you're a professional, if you're a doctor or an attorney, um, people perceive you to be just a better person in general. Yeah, a def and definitely a better person than someone working at McDonald's or working in our retail stores, right? That's a narrative that if you're, if you're up there on that level, you can look down on everybody else. That's what's pushed forward. Thank you. Next, next slide. So on a societal level, it's being gifted with a car at 16. A lot of adults are still taking the bus because affording and being able to maintain a car is very expensive. So if you are just gifted with a car at 16, you may have some class privilege there. And that's okay to acknowledge. Um, not having to worry about being able to afford college. So if it was never a conversation, you might have some class privilege. Being able to afford a nanny or a child care without having to rely on the eldest child to take on the caregiving role for younger siblings. Um, this was something I, I unfortunately would have to battle with other advocates about in shelter, where they would say, how irresponsible is it for this mother to let the 13-year-old watch the younger siblings? How irresponsible is it that they're making their kids do clothing? No, that's survival. And child care, we already know, is very expensive. Um, being able to swear or even commit a crime without people attributing it to the low morals of your class. Large families are celebrated, right? We, and we've seen it happen. Um, John and Kate plus eight. The Duggars, which were like 19, 20 kids and counting, they got TV shows. What happened to Nadia Shulman or Solomon? People don't even know her name because she was so uh, dehumanized. They call her Octomom because she was too brown and too poor to be having all those kids. Um, I did, however, see there's a new show coming to, I think, TLC, um, and it's a black family, and they're like 11 kids. Because the mom, she's having multiples, which I think is fantastic because I'm a twin. Shout out to the twin. Um, but again, this is just happening. This narrative are just starting to change. Um, having access to healthy food options in your own neighborhood, because food deserts are very real. Folks in urban communities and sometimes in very rural communities will not have access uh, to healthy food options in their community or in their grocery store. And so they'll have to, trans they'll have to trans um, transport themselves and their kids out of their community, maybe on the bus, and then lug back all their kids and their groceries, which is a task. And then choosing to wear secondhand clothing. So I love a good deal. I love a good thrift store, but those are not my only options. So to, to, to not acknowledge that for a lot of folks that is the only option would be to not, rec would not be a recognition of my own class privilege. Um, and so even when we think of, um, when we think of dress codes and shelter, um, we really have to think about the messaging that that's then sending to folks who may not be in the same economic class or have the same economic privileges that we may have as advocates. So in terms of domestic violence, how does class privilege show up? Next slide. So when you have class privilege, you're seen as needing only temporary relief instead of being seen as scamming the system when applying for benefits. You're seen as more honest because you come from a good background or a good neighborhood. Uh, the ability to afford a private attorney and not having to rely on a public defender or pro bono attorney to accept your case. Now, I will say I know a lot of public defenders and I know a lot of attorneys that do pro bono work and they are fantastic, but their wait lists are immense. And so the likelihood that your case will actually be picked up before you go to court um, is a toss up for a lot of folks. Um, and then 
this is something I've seen from advocates as well, which I always had to push back on. Um, shaming a victim who does not leave their relationship or not leave the home by saying things like, I'd rather be homeless than abused. Well, if homelessness is actually on your horizon, a lot of folks would rather just take the hit than have to take their kids into a shelter or have to be street homeless with their children or with themselves, because there's a lot of violence that you're susceptible to as well when you're living on the street. Next slide. So I saw you pull a food stamps card out your Gucci bag, but that's none of my business. So again, these narratives that if you are poor, you are undeserving, um, where when we really even take that apart, you don't know if that Gucci bag is real. You don't know if that was a gift from their mom. You don't know if that Gucci bag, you know, they saved up for a year to buy that. Um, this would be a conversation that would happen a lot of times around food stamps and the food that people would buy on their food stamps. Um, because you're on food stamps, that, that means your child doesn't deserve a nice birthday. That means you shouldn't be able to treat yourself to a nice meal, you know, once a week. Is that what we're saying? Because just say that. Just say you're undeserving instead of saying, well, I noticed this in these snide remarks, right? Um, $200 per kid, y'all have more as if that $200 is actually going to go a long way. We know how expensive children are. Um, again, the differences between the opioid and heroin ep ep epidemics. Um, and then this sweater on the bottom, that's a Yeezy sweater, Kanye West's line. Um, that sweater costs $1,300, and that's literally a mortgage payment. Um, but if someone were homeless and wearing that sweater, they would be ruled invisible. So what are, what are we really saying to folks when we're, we're charging $1,300 for a tattered sweater, but folks who are actually homeless and wearing tattered clothes are deemed invisible? Next slide. And so what comes up are power dynamics that then exist between victims and advocates. Big reminder, although we go into domestic work, domestic violence work with best intentions, we still operate from a place of privilege and power when working with survivors. The power dynamics that come with being deemed an authority is something to pay attention to. You cannot exert power and expect to empower. Next slide. And so I really want us to look at then what intersectionality means, what it means to show up as a whole person, why the varying identities you have are so important to your lived experience, Audre Lorde says there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. Um, intersectionality was a term coined by Kimberly Crenshaw as a framework designed to explore the dynamics between identities and connected systems of oppression. So the connections between race, class, and gender with patriarchy, white supremacy, and capitalism. How are these things interchanging? Um, next slide. And so I actually have three short video clips that I love to show because I love this series. Um, you can actually find these clips on YouTube. Um, you just, they're part of the Race And series that was produced by raceforward.org. Um, and if you just type in hashtag Race And, a lot of these videos will pull up. I highly recommend watching them because they are just really good examples of intersectionality and how it shows up in people's lives. Um, and it gives you a more in-depth look into um, folks who are different from you and the things that they're navigating and experiencing on a daily basis. So Fajita, if you're able to pull up those slides, we can just watch them back to back and then we'll keep going. I'm Jamia Wilson, Executive Director of Women Action and the Media. Race and gender. Race and disability. Race and class. Intersectionality is something that I think about every day because I'm living it. And 
I also think about what it means to show up in the world in my specific body with my specific experience and background. I am African American. I'm also straight. I am able-bodied except for the fact that I was born with a visual impairment. So I walk around with a disability that sometimes people can't see. I was raised in an upper middle class background. So I have class privilege. All of those things play into power privilege and marginalization that I experience depending on those different aspects of my identity. Even though race is a social construct and we know that genetically there is no such thing as race, it's this very powerful, powerful illusion that's been perpetuated and used to kill people. It's been used to justify war. It's been used to enslave people. It's been used to force people into indentured servitude and to disregard that history is disrespectful to all the people who suffered and fought for me to be able to live closer to freedom today. When I am in feminist spaces and sometimes I might be told that it's divisive for me to bring up race, that we need to focus on the issue at hand, which is gender. Or it might come up in a space where we're doing racial justice work and I might be told by another person of color, well, this isn't an issue about your gender. This isn't an issue about race and it doesn't matter what the gender issue is. Race has to take priority and precedence in this issue. That's impossible for me to make a prioritization of various parts of my identity that are equally integral to who I am and that are inextricably connected. We want to make sure that we're not single storying other people and that we aren't contributing to that, that people need to be able to show up as their whole selves and that's better for us as a community and as a culture and a society. What I really want to ask people who ask me that question is, what part of your own internalized depression or your own addiction to the drug that is privilege makes you fear full liberation for all people? There's a problem with even seeing this as divisive. There's a problem when we're not actually understanding that the liberation of all people makes us all free. When trans women of color are free, that's bringing me close to freedom. When Syrian refugees are free, that brings me close to freedom. It's really important for us to think about that, not to think about how we protect our own privilege with a structure that doesn't even work for us, but how do we create more openness and liberation for all human beings, for all humanity. My name is Arielle Newton. I am the founder of BlackMillennials.com. I'm also an organizer with Black Lives Matter New York City. Race and gender, race and sexuality. I am Black. I'm also a woman. I'm also queer. That means that I have to deal with racism, patriarchy, and homophobia. We have to be comfortable and clear that we're not playing oppression Olympics. It's just recognizing that these various systems of oppression are going to work to marginalize some folks more than others. To them, I say they are uncomfortable with the depth of existence. I think they're hiding behind their fear. I think they hide behind the fear of recognizing even when they perpetuate certain things. So for example, white feminists get very upset when black feminists are like, no, we're not gonna be all women. We're gonna say that black women, indigenous women are oppressed more than white women. And if you're uncomfortable with that, then that's, that means that you're not fighting for all women to begin with. Ultimately, that was that's what makes our battle stronger if we can recognize um, and be more comprehensive in how we go about advocating when we understand that folks are intersectional beings. Our oppression doesn't all look the same. Our oppression is determined by what we look like, what we sound like, where we grew up, where we went to school, if we went to school. And that's why it's important that as we try to dismantle oppressive systems that we're clear that some folks are oppressed more than others.
we have seen primarily, even within Black liberation struggles, some of these oppressive behaviors repeat themselves. Black women and Black transgender people are often erased in silence, their labor co-opted by dominant heteronormative ideals. We have to unlearn these behaviors and ultimately understand that these behaviors came by way of white supremacy. So if we're clear that our oppression, the ways that we uh, perpetuate oppression within our own community, we can better achieve racial justice. Sometimes I say that I put my blackness before my womanhood or I put my blackness before my queerness and I'm trying to unlearn that that compartmentalizing of my being my entire being is what informs how i navigate the world how i respond to injustice how i promote justice it's hard for people to be complicated or to recognize complication folks like things easy today i'm going to say no more <laughs> today i say that i am a full human being and my humanity is wrapped up in a lot of different layers and tears and so many different things and that's beautiful it should be celebrated, although it might be more difficult to understand. Garola Aditi, performance artist, goddess, ancient jazz priestess of Mother Africa. Race and gender, race and class. So I'm a black, indigenous, Cuban, Nigerian, American woman who's trained. And I'm the daughter of an immigrant. I come from the ghettos of Baltimore. People have to understand what all of the histories of all of those identities in order to understand really my positionality within the world. There are poor black people, there are rich black people, there are black cis women, there are black trans women. And so intersectionality is telling us that we have to discuss race in particular, right? Like, cause that's the topic that I'm using. Like if we're talking about race that we have to talk about it in its full scope. Yes, we are sharing an experience because for example, two black people, we are sharing this experience because we're both black, but I'm a black trans woman and so numbers don't lie and we all know that black trans women um, in particular are some of the most marginalized in our community and the most affected by structural structural oppression There's this concept that we are all given the same opportunities, but it's not true. If we look historically and we talk about, you know, this idea of pulling yourself up by the bootstraps, Black people actually did pull themselves up by their bootstraps. But we then have places like Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921. There was thriving Black neighborhoods, Black people, buying from Black businesses, owning Black businesses, investing in Black businesses. And right, and that's what they're told. All you have to do is be rich and nobody can ever hurt you again. All you have to do is buy into the system and move upward and you'll be safe. What then happened was their white neighbors would then come and literally commit acts of genocide. And so now today, right, we have people who could have had old money who are now poor. And so what is that psychologically saying to these people that when you thrive, when you succeed, you're still not safe. And so we're talking about race and class, and we're not understanding the history of race and class as it presents itself in America in particular, because that's where we're living, right? And we're having a fool's conversation. If someone comes to me and they say to me, you are creating differences. I would say, no, that's actually not true. Because in my indigenous cultures, people who were different were still essential to society. Within European cultures, particularly within the rise of uh, patriarchy and the way that it manifests 
through religion is that differences little by little were no longer celebrated and they were stamped out. And the one thing that, that structural oppression gives us that we should all aspire to generally is of a cis het white man. So when we're talking about intersectionality, right? I'm always being an intersectional being because I'm all of these things always at once. If you're having a conversation with me and you are having, you're not having a conversation understanding um, that I come with all of those identities within the conversation, then how are we supposed to move forward? Thanks, Anita. Uh, and you can go to the next slide. There we go. Um, and so, again, definitely take a look at more of those videos on YouTube. They're really good. Um, and it'll take you down a rabbit hole of thinking about intersectionality and thinking about identities and histories of identities. So it's really, I really had a good time watching them. I pretty much sat through one day and watched as many as I could. Um, and as we mentioned before, Black women have been fighting for ourselves for a long time. And the Black community as a whole has really been find, trying to find ways to protect ourselves and uplift ourselves for a long time too. Um, next slide. But there have been some unintentional consequences of some of the protective strategies that we've engaged in. Um, number one that comes to mind for me is respectability politics. Um, and so respectability politics is basically the notion that if you present yourself in a certain way, if you conduct yourself in a certain way, that you're less likely to experience violence. So what comes up in that conversation then is the politics of hair. Um, the politics of hair for black women in particular is a very real thing. Um, I could be fired from my job for having locks and it's just my, my expression of myself, my expression of my culture. Um, so when you see folks who may be in shelter, for instance, I'll use that example. You see someone in shelter who always has their hair and nails done don't think that they're not taking their, their lived experience seriously or they're not trying to uplift themselves, but you're still supposed to look a certain way. Um, my grandma, the same thing with dressing the court. My grandma would always say, just because you're poor doesn't mean you have to look poor. Um, you want to give people as many opportunities to view you as who you are um, as you can. So if you need to keep your hair and nails um, up, please do that because that's how you're going to get a job interview. That's how you're going to get that job. Um, that's how you're going to move up in your position. That's how the school system is going to take you seriously as a parent when you come to pick your kids up. Um, a lot more goes into it than just the aesthetic part of it. Um, the mask and code switching. So this is something that um, has been an unintentional consequence really because bias shows up when people do code switch or when people are seen as code switching. Um, but people have very legitimate reasons why they do it. They can't show up as a whole self because of bias as well. Um, and the pressure of racial uplift is a very real thing. So there's a lot of pressure um, from even within the black community to show up as the right type of black person. Um, because we've seen when you don't show up in the classiest way you can or in the you know, most professional way you can, people are gonna enact violence on you. And that's been the experience for black people. Uh, next slide. And then the code of silence or, co or yeah, the code of silence so no snitching has been a common um, discourse in a community, um, and it's really based in you don't tell outside parties your problems because they're going to enact violence on you when you do, or you're going to give them more reasons to hate us. That's sort of the narrative that's happened. Uh, racial loyalty. So, you know, you don't turn another Black person in, you handle it, and you address it within the community. Um, it was seen as protection from state-sanctioned violence, which we know to be very true. We know that this is still happening. Um, insulation equals survival. Um, really thinking about the impact that mass incarceration has had on the Black community, not just on Black men, but as on Black families as a whole. Um, the and then the impact of carceral feminism and punishment, which carceral feminism was basically um, feminists gathering together, uh, largely white second wave feminists saying, hey, if you lock abusers up, the whole community will be better. 
But in reality, for communities of color, specifically Black folk, that's not what we were saying. We were saying, hey, we might need some different alternatives to justice, but simply locking someone up when they're the head of household or the primary breadwinner or they're just central to our family and our community, that's not actually going to benefit us all the time. Uh, next slide. And some other key concepts to really think about when you're working with survivors. Again, we talked about anger. Uh, mental health and trauma is something we don't talk enough about. Um, we definitely don't talk about, well, no, that's not true. We're starting to talk about mental health in the black community. We didn't really talk about it before. There was a common saying that when we don't go to therapy, we go to church, right? So we're finally starting to learn um, how to trust black psychologists or black therapists a little bit better or trust therapists in general. Um, carceral punishment, again, just locking folks up um, instead of really thinking about what other alternatives are there for justice and what does justice mean for black women. Uh, motherhood, we talked about briefly. Trust and rapport is a big one as well, because I may have a great rapport with you as a survivor, but may not trust you a lick. And that doesn't have anything to do with you as a person, but again, you are part of a system that has been known to hurt me in my community. Um, so I've learned to, na to navigate you, or I've learned to na navigate the system. That doesn't mean I'm trying to play you, but again, trust and rapport are two different things. Um, colorism, which we talked about a little bit. Um, victim, survivor, true victim. Again, there's still this narrative that black women are somehow deserving of domestic violence um, because we, did, we don't know our place or we didn't act in a certain way or because we're um, inherently angry or violent. Um, fear is a very legitimate response to violence. A lot of people forget that black women can be and are afraid of their abusive partners or are afraid of the ramifications for even speaking out against the violence, um, which is why they may not tell you their whole history or their full story. Representation is really important where, especially if you are in a community that serves predominantly people of color and you have very few people of color on your staff, that's a problem. Um, even thinking that there are no qualified candidates is um, really rooted in some implicit bias that should be sorted out. Um, and then thinking about Eurocentric standards of beauty and what does it mean for folks to feel beautiful and feel included and feel special and are your spaces specifically designed to uplift those notions or not. Uh, next slide. And so I found this quote on um, Facebook actually is from a black therapist. Um, and she says, if you're going to take a stand for improving mental health, you have to understand that addressing mental health goes way beyond hiring more therapists and talking about mental health on social media. If we're really serious about tackling mental health problems as a country, it means rolling up our sleeves and taking down the barriers that prevent people from getting the help they need. Even if those people are different from us, lead different lives and make choices we don't agree with. So health insurance is a mental health issue. I can't help a client who can't afford to see me. Housing is a mental health issue. I can't use therapy to help a client whose depression and anxiety come directly from sleeping in the streets. Food insecurity is a mental health issue. I can't help a client who isn't taking their medicine because their pills say take with food and they have nothing to eat. Healthcare is a mental health issue. I can't help a client whose depression is actually a thyroid condition they can't afford to get treated. Wages are a mental health issue. I can't help a client whose anxiety comes from the fact that they are one missed shift away from not being able to make rent. Child care is a mental health issue. I can't help a client who works 80 hours per week to afford, day afford daycare and doesn't have enough time or energy left to come see me. Drug policing is a mental health issue. I can't help a client who ended up in prison because they got caught self-medicating with illegal substances. Police brutality is a mental health issue. I can't help a client whose anxiety is a very real and justified fear of ending up as a hashtag. So I really think that's important to think about, when you think about mental health, you really have to think about all the different aspects of mental health and not just uh, what's wrong with that person or what they need to get fixed. Um, because there are a lot of fixes that could happen if we're really addressing systemic barriers and systemic oppression. Next slide. Next. And so these are some useful resources if you're interested in doing a little bit more digging. Um, into racial justice and how it connects to domestic violence work because they absolutely go hand in hand when you think about black womanhood. And next slide. And these are some of my favorite writers, activists, authors. Um, if you're interested in learning more or getting a different perspective on black women's lived experience, read them. Um, they are amazing. Octavia Butler, 
just like racism and robots. She's a science fiction author. She's amazing. And Tadaki Shange, um, Sonia Sanchez. She's a poet. She's amazing. So all these people really speak to lived experience of black women, how violence has been um, an, an integral part in our lives, unfortunately. And just, again, our experience. So I highly recommend them as well as others. And I think that's it. Next slide. So this is my contact information. Um, again, I'm the training specialist, so you can reach out to me or go through um, our, our site, um, our website to contact with any of us. And on that note, I'm going to turn it back over to Karma. All right, everyone. So Karma had to step out for a call, um, but we are officially done for the day. We want to thank you all for joining us. We want to thank Ayana and Umi for their amazing presentations. Um, we hope that you got all enjoyed the presentations and enjoyed the discussion. We hope you all will join us again tomorrow. Same time, we'll be back at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Um, again, just thank you all for joining and have a wonderful evening, afternoon.